All right. Um, well, look, good morning, good afternoon, wherever we are, um, everybody. We're almost ready to start at 2.30 on the dot. I want to say something very, very quickly. Firstly, a very warm welcome to everybody on the call and the speakers. Thank you for coming along to the GW1 um, session. Uh, the session contains a bunch of different topics, including um, you know, binary black hole coalescences, but a, a range of different things, um, accreting neutrons, detection of gravitational waves from accreting neutron stars. Um, could I ask everybody during the, um, while the speaker is speaking to keep your camera off and muted so that the speaker comes to the fore um, on the page. Um, if you have any questions at any point, please don't hesitate to pop them into the chat box and um, also put up the blue hand uh, during the question time, I'll call on you. And the last uh, point, please, and I say this sort of gently, but also strictly, uh, we must keep to the time exactly because of the online nature of the proceedings. So um, I, uh, I'll just ask everybody, please, to keep that in mind. Every talk is 20 minutes, which is 15 minutes plus five minutes question. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So welcome again. And the very first speaker is Alessandro Trani, um, and he's talking about spin misalignment and black hole binaries from young star clusters. Um, and unfortunately, he seems to be absent. Alessandro, are you there, please? All right. Um, that's unfortunate. We can't wait for Alessandro. So, um, Hector, I might ask you, uh, please, if you're willing to give your talk instead, um, and hopefully Alessandro will show up um, for the next slot. Um, You'll be speaking about the IMR Phenom program. Hi, good morning. Um, yes, let me share again the, the presentation. Um, yes, hi, I'm, I'm Hector Estellés. I'm a PhD student at the University of the Balearic Islands. And I'm glad to, to have the opportunity of presenting this status report about the, the IMR Phenom program. Uh, on behalf of the phenom modeling uh, community, that it's a, a huge community. Um, let's start first with a very brief introduction of compact binary coalescent signals. Uh, these are at the moment the, the only type of detected gravitational wave uh, signals, and they encode a lot of information about the, the system. Uh, for example, the, the individual masses and, and the individual spins, sky position, and other uh, parameters. Unfortunately, uh, there are no full analytical solutions to the to body problem in general relativity. So our knowledge about these signals comes from uh, different partial approaches. Uh, perturbative approaches like the post-Newtonian theory are valid for describing the system and the signals uh, in the weak field regime of the early spiral. Black hole perturbation theory is able to, to describe the, the post-merger emission in the ring down states. However, our only knowledge about the highly dynamical um, strong field regime of the late in spiral, the plunge and, and the merger comes from numerical relativity simulations, which are uh, expensive. Um, then waveform models that collect together these different uh, sources of information in an efficient way are crucial for gravitational wave science mainly for the, for the inference of the source properties, but also for tests of uh, general relativity and to some extent for searches and, and rates, uh, etc. Uh, one of the main uh, frameworks for modeling uh, compact binary coalescent signals is the so-called uh, IMR uh, phenom program, which aims to provide uh, accurate and fast representations of, of the signals focusing on, on the signals uh, themselves. Uh, phenom models uh, provide um, an extreme completion of the, of the available information that uh, we have mentioned before in fast uh, closed form uh, expressions uh, for the waveforms that are uh, directly applicable in, in data analysis and, and very computationally efficient. 
um, there has been a, a continuous development of, of models uh, during the years towards uh, more accurate and, and more general uh, models. Uh, it's time including the new physics or, or improving the, the accuracy uh, with the effort of, of many people involved, uh, led uh, mainly by the UIB and, and Cardiff groups. The, the third generation, based on the, on the model IMR Phenom D, was uh, very successful and it was employed in the, in the first detection of gravitational waves and and in the analysis of the first two released uh, transient catalogs. It is uh, still employed uh, today, specifically the, the processing model IMR Phenom PV2 for exploratory parameter estimation runs on, on new events. But um, in this talk, we are going to, to focus on, on the fourth generation of, of models, which uh, suppose a, a thorough improvement in, in accuracy over the, the previous generation. And also we are going to mention a, a new family in time domain uh, aimed to facilitate the, the modeling of, of more generic uh, waveforms and to improve some aspects of, of the Fourier domain uh, models. Uh, let's start with the core model of the new generation. Uh, this is uh, IMR Phenom XAS that is described in, in this work by Pratt et al. And well, uh, it is a, a piecewise uh, closed form uh, model for the amplitude and, and the phase of the Fourier domain representation of the dominant uh, quadrupole mode or gravitational radiation. As it is uh, commonly done in, in, in IMR phenom models, the frequency domain is split in, in three regions. Uh, and the information from, from post-Newtonian theory, random analysis, and, and numerical relativity is combined to, to produce and, and calibrate the, the ansatz in, in these regions. Um, this model uh, supposes a, a, a real improvement over the, the, previous, uh, the previous generation model, IMR Phenom D. Um, mainly, it extends the the data set, the, the calibration data set of numerical relativity simulations from 19 to, to more than, than 500 non processing simulations. Uh, it also includes uh, intermediate mass ratio uh, in spiral waveforms uh, completed from the Tukolsky equation. Um, the calibration is now uh, full three dimensional, including uh, unequal uh, spin effects, where in the previous generation. This was not explicitly in, included. And uh, some of the ansatz, uh, especially in the, ter in the intermediate region, were, were improved to, to allow more, more flexibility and, and improve the, the accuracy. Um, let's see how, how these improvements uh, translate into, into accuracy. Well, um, here we can observe a, a comparison with hybridized uh, numerical relativity uh, simulations. And we can see that the improvement is typically two orders of magnitude in, in accuracy with respect to the, the previous generation. And, and also we can see in this comparison in the, in the right figure uh, that a phenom XAS is able to reproduce more accurately the, the numerical relativity surrogate model, uh, NR hype sur, that, uh, for example, uh, other uh, state of the art approaches like the, like the SUV. Uh, approach. So this shows that, that focusing on, on modeling the, the signals in, 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 instead of, of focusing on, on, the, on the dynamics can, can, can lead to, to better accuracy. It, it also has some caveats if one wants to, to extend to, to more generic situations. The, the next big breakthrough of the new generation was the, the first multimode uh, model with the subdominant uh, harmonic content uh, fully calibrated to, to numerical relativity, IMR Phenom XHN, that is described in, in this work of uh, Garcia Quiroz uh, et al. And essentially, uh, it adds the, these uh, subdominant uh, harmonics to the, to the dominant harmonic that was modeled in, in Phenom XAS. Uh, the model is constructed uh, based on a on a proper rescaling of the in spiral phase of, of the modes, but uh, the, the amplitude of the modes is uh, fully calibrated and also the, the intermediate and major ring down regions of, of the phase of, of its mode. 
uh, it has the same calibration data set as the 2.2, including the, the intermediate mass ratio uh, in spirals. Uh, also, another important thing about uh, this model is that it's the, the first analytical model that, that includes uh, mode mixing effects for, for the spinning black holes, in particular for the for the through mode, and as we can see in this figure. And well, um, the model was constructed with a great emphasis on, on being consistent with the global uh, multimode structure and, and satisfying correctly the, the relations between the, the different uh, modes. And this is uh, exemplified, for example, in the, in the accurate prediction of the gravitational wave uh, recoil, that in the gravitational recoil, sorry, that this model uh, can do for, for non-processing uh, systems. Another uh, crucial development that was included in the in the XHM model was the multibanding technique for the evaluation of the of the wave. Uh, this was an, an adaptation of an existing technique in the literature, but for the first time it was applied to a full uh, multimode uh, in spinal merger ring down model in this work by Garcia Quiroz et, et al. The key idea is that for uh, that analysis uh, one needs a uh, fine sampling with a constant uh, frequency uh, spacing. But in, in some regions of the waveform, particularly in the, in the ring now, this generates an, an overpopulation of, of points, of expensive points that it's not really needed for, for representing the, the waveform. So the idea is to compute the model on a, on a much coarser uh, non-uniform uh, grid that is selected by analytical estimates of, of, er of error uh, thresholds and then extend in a, in a cheap way to the finer uh, uniform grid. With this method, uh, IMR Phenome XHM becomes the, the fastest model, uh, the fastest full IMR uh, multimode model available. And by extension, its processing extension benefits, uh, benefits from this. The processing extension, uh, IMR Phenome XPHM, is the default model of the family. Currently is the most generic one, although still is restricted to quasi-circular binary black hole systems, but with uh, generic uh, spins. Uh, and is described in this paper by uh, Pratt et al. Uh, it is based on the standard uh, twisting up approximation employed in other precision models. But uh, here the focus is uh, on allowing uh, a high flexibility for the, for the user. It incorporates the, the analytical description of, of precession that uh, was included in the previous generation in the, in the Phenom PV2 model. But it also incorporates as default a recent uh, analytical description of the Euler angles uh, based on a multi-scale analysis of the generic uh, double spin uh, system. And therefore it includes uh, more degrees of, of freedom than the previous approach. No? It, it includes uh, double spin. In for information. Um, the model also allows the, the user to, to select the variations of, of these two approaches. Uh, for example, uh, one can select the, the post-Newtonian order employed for the, for the computation of, of several quantities like the orbital angular momentum norm, etc. Another important uh, source of uh, flexibility is the computation of the final spin. Uh, allowing several motivated approximations to, to compute the, the processing final spin. Um, also, the, the model benefits from the fast implementation of the, of the underlying uh, Phenom uh, XHM model uh, due, uh, due to, to multibanding, but also mul uh, multibanding is also applied to the angles, uh, increasing further the, the evaluation speed of the, of the model. Uh, during the development of the model was also crucial to, to state and check uh, correctly the, the precision conventions in, in Fourier domain, which can be a, a bit tricky. And we think that the paper uh, collects in a, in a clear way uh, an, an exposition of, of these conventions. Um, the model has, however, uh, some caveats, uh, especially in the major ring down uh, region of precision systems, mainly because it employs the the stationary uh, phase approximation to compute the, the processing uh, transfer functions, and this could be inaccurate in, in the major ring down region. Also, it does not include uh, final state information on the processing angles, 
uh, it just extrapolates the post-Newtonian expressions uh, outside its range of validity. But however, despite of this, the model is, is really very uh, accurate for the, for the majority of, of systems. So given all the, all the benefits of the new generation of models, uh, they are becoming the, the standard choice for parameter estimation analysis on, on current uh, detected signals. Uh, in our group, uh, we have performed uh, three extensive and detailed studies in employing these models. The first one was a, a reanalysis of GW190412, that it's an, an interesting uh, asymmetric mass uh, event where the subdominant modes uh, plays an important role. In this paper by Coleoni et al., uh, we checked in a systematic way the, the, the effect of, of the options of the, of the model and the, and the sampler settings. And, and well, and we repeated the, the same kind of extensive analysis also to the reanalysis of, of the first uh, catalog of, of transient uh, gravitational wave uh, signals uh, with the full generic uh, model, including uh, higher modes and, and precessions, and is described in this paper by my Mateo Lucena et al. Uh, between these two first papers, uh, I think uh, we have performed more than uh, 500 uh, parameter estimation runs which shows the, the efficiency and the possibilities of, of these models. Uh, finally, we have also submitted a, a detailed study of GW190521 that was uh, presented yesterday on the VH4 session by Mate Mateu. And here uh, we re-examined uh, some results that uh, other groups uh, reported on, on this event uh, employing uh, these models, no? IMR, Phenomics, PHM. But also we include in the comparison a new time domain uh, model that, that we are going to, to explain next. As a final remark on, on parameter estimation, the number of, of works uh, employing this last generation of, of phenom models is uh, constantly increasing. Um, some of the works uh, report uh, unexpected features in, in old well uh, known events, showing that uh, Having uh, processing multimode waveforms that are uh, computationally uh, efficient uh, allows uh, more in deep uh, studies no? of, of previous and, and current results. And, and this is becoming the, the default standard for, for gravitational wave uh, astronomy. Finally, um, let's introduce uh, the new family of, of phenom models in the time domain. Peter, just that... sorry to interrupt, but. Um... Please keep an eye on the time. Uh, you're already ah. in your question time. Ah, sorry, sorry. Um, yes, uh, well, uh, very briefly, um, this uh, time domain uh, family, no, uh, what uh, was developed to um, to overcome some of the of the caveats that we have mentioned for the frequency uh, domain models, no, and it includes uh, three new models uh, explained in, in in these publications. And well, essentially, uh, it ports the, the standard techniques of the Fourier domain phenomenon modeling to the time domain. This allows to, to despite of the stationary phase approximation, and also to include some improvements in the in the renowned region. And then uh, this becomes this these models um, um, highly appropriate for for studying uh, massive uh, processing events. No, and we have employed to to a reanalysis of of 1905-21 with interesting uh, conclusions. And also we are preparing a, a reanalysis of the high mass events of the second uh, transient uh, catalog. And all these models presented here are, are uh, available as open source models no, in the LIGO algorithm library. And well, the, the work uh, towards uh, more generic models is, is still ongoing. So stay tuned for, for future uh, phenomena updates. And that's it. Thanks a lot for attending. And if people have questions, sorry for, for passing the, the time. No, no, thanks very much, Hector. And we did start a minute late because um, the other speaker wasn't present. So thank you very much. That's a really um, interesting talk. Uh, any questions, please, for, for Hector, either in the chat or if you want to raise your hand. Yes, Gustav, please. Uh, hi, Hector. Uh, can you go back to your last slide where you showed the IMO phenom T uh, results? So, uh, in there, yes. the last slide, number 12, I think. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, here i can see a bimodality in the tphm uh, lal inference posterior do you know what is the reason for that uh, here for for 190521 you mean yeah yeah uh, yes what what we have observed for for this event is that uh, one recovers the the multimodal uh, posterior structure no for the mass ratio that was reported uh, originally by by the nits and and, and mm -hmm. uh, however we, we find that the the support at high mass ratio it's it's uh, much less supported no that in the original analysis of nits and capano the, the original analysis also employed a, a version of the fourier domain model that contained an an inefficient choice of the final spin that that enhanced this this feature no in, in this work, we reanalyze also with XPHM and, and the Nitz and Capano results now are much. I mean, with the new version of XPHM, we are not able to, to reproduce the results because this feature of, of the final spin is, is corrected. No? However, the, the event still presents a, a multimodal structure. This is also true for XPHM. You can see here in, the, in, the, in this figure that, that XPHM also has some, some bimodality in the in the masses and, and also in the mass ratio, it's not shown here, but it also has some bimodality in the in the mass ratio. So yes, it, it, it's a challenging event now because it's mostly written down. So, so the genesis uh, can play an, an important uh, role here. But well, if you want to, to look at, at the paper, we will explain in, in detail uh, the paper is mentioned here. Uh, uh, this paper uh, we we explain in detail or or study. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the question, and thank you again very much, Hector, for an interesting talk. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Francesco Salemi, and he will be speaking about higher order in spiral modes. Francesco. Yes. Can I, just while you're getting started, can I please emphasize to everybody, because the speak, first speaker did not appear, we now have a different timing. So um, if I could just ask everybody to um, be aware of that. Thank you, Francesco. OK. Can you hear me and you see my slides? Perfect. OK, then let's start. Okay, uh, well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, whatever is more appropriate. I'm Francesco Salemi from the Department of Physics of the University of Trento, and I'm going to talk about a method to detect higher order modes in the spiral phase of compact binary coalescences. But, but uh, let me first. Uh, 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 a word of uh, about the other authors because this is their collaboration work. There is a paper which is uh, in final stages, just before being uh, submitted to to a journal. And there is a long list of authors, mostly from uh, the side of the Atlantic, uh, with respect to coherent with first uh, group, the, the group developing and using the coherent with first pipeline. Um, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with that, but it's, it's one of the traditional wave pipelines uh, for burst purposes mostly, but also for, for binary coalescences. Um, okay, but that was really <laughs> a minimal resume of, 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 of uh, uh, what you need to know about higher remotes. I assume that all here, all, all of you need knows all the all the basics and even more than that but what i wanted to highlight is it, it, it's really oh yeah but wait i have not full slides sorry yeah uh so all i wanted to highlight really was that, that since the very beginning from gw uh, 150914 uh, uh what we were seeing was those binaries with roughly equal masses, not so much of a spinning that was evident. And, and therefore, uh, there was a really no need to, to go farther the, the, the quadruple and, and, and consider higher order modes. Uh, but um, 
uh, of course, when, when it, there is an easy way, it's, it's, it's just get a system with, uh, uh, with uh, unequal masses and, and, and immediately the, the, the higher order mode start contri contributing a significant amount of, of the total SNR. And, and, uh, and so that the more they, they become unequal masses, the more this becomes relevant, uh, though the, the total SNR uh, it, it may be dropping. Um, uh, and, and why do we care about high, high or the most? There are plenty of reasons uh, to, to care about those, but I, I guess that the, the one, my, my favorite one it, it is to be able to uh, to uh, to break the distance inclination degeneracy by measuring measuring independently the the, the, the inclination of the source over multiple uh, over different subdomain multiples and okay uh, I I mentioned GW fifteen or nine fourteen there's plenty of other uh, uh, mergers that are similar that are so called vanilla or orthodox or whatever you want to call them uh, some call them boring because that there's not much in, to, to learn from those but uh, I, I don't, obviously i don't agree about that but uh, nevertheless by uh, with with the evolution of the sensitivity of, of our detectors uh, we are gradually exploring uh, other parts of the parameter space namely larger inclinations, smaller and smaller mass ratios, uh, larger effective spin, a little bit of precession, and maybe some, some elasticity. And, and, and of course, as we find those rarer, um, unorthodox, let's say so, uh, uh, events, then we see more and more uh, that higher uh, multiple may play a role in that. And here I listed uh, uh, two such odd ones. Uh, well, the, the, the first one was GW 190412. That's well known. It's the mass ratio was uh, some, somewhat a little bit of more extreme. And therefore, uh, there were some, some clear evidences that there were some uh, higher order more uh, connected to that. And then there is the second one, GW 190814, which is definitely a, a, a more unorthodox uh, event due to the component masses and the tension between the secondary masses. I, I, I will assume you, you are familiar with, with this, these two guys and especially the second one. Anyway, it's, 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 a, it's the secondary mass, it's, it, it's fine. Well, the, the whole thing is, I would say it's quite challenging. Uh, I, I mean, that, that's my gist on that, about, about the, what it is and so, and so on and so forth. Anyway, that, that Q mass ratio was, was fairly small. And given also, uh, given that, that the signal is specific coming from the, from the higher order mode is particularly uh, large. And also that the, the system is kind of unorthodox. So, so uh, there, there was this uh, this push to to uh, complement the analysis with some further evidence coming from uh, some method which was not necessarily uh, a matched filter or approach, and, and that's where coherent filters with a waveform agnostic pipeline came into play with a such a uh, such a measurement uh, uh, and, and and the basic idea well okay that 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 is taken from a public lecture uh, on, on the very same event and that was just to show that the, the, the posterior distributions for for these two events and to show that in violence the, the w1908 14 as a a serious distribution for optimal SNR for the three three uh, multiple moments, which is fairly large for uh, well, roughly from uh, between five and eight or so well, a little bit less, but, but that's it. And, and it's clearly uh, well uh, incompatible with the Gaussian noise uh, uh, um, uh, 
distribution, while, well, the, the one for 1904 or 12, it's, it's still not compatible, but it, well, there's more tail of that, which is, uh, which, which could be compatible with Gershon knots. Okay, so let, let, let's go directly to the, the basic idea. Uh, what I plotted here is just, I, uh, I took the, the, uh, the maximum likelihood uh, posterior sample from a PE run, including all the modes, and, and, and I subtracted the two two modes just because it's, it's too powerful, too strong, and, and otherwise the, 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 the figure was a little bit less easy to read. And then you see the, those trucks uh, basically well, that there are dotted lines are, are showing some some tracks uh, for the different uh, um, for the different modes, and you see the the way coherent reverse is is reconstructing uh, uh, those modes uh, without knowing anything about the, the waveform, uh, just by considering the data of a multiple detectors and trying to find some coherence. On the signal, it's selecting, it's projecting over some uh, some uh, waveform, uh, some wavelet basis, and 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 this squares here, these pixels are exactly the amplitude of this uh, of of this projection uh, of this, uh, uh, yeah, and so you, you see immediately that the three three modes, it's clearly visible in, in this one. And it's really on, on, on top of the track for, for the 3.3. Three. Uh, there is uh, some evidence also for the 4.4 four, and maybe a little bit also for the 2.1. The 5.5 five instead, it's, it's, it's less visible. So the, the idea, the basic idea is, is to concentrate on this track, integrate this, this energy along these tracks. Uh, and that's it. So that's, it's a very simple idea. And here uh, I'm, I'm resuming what happens for uh, GW190814. Uh, on the top right, you, you have uh, our test statistic, our relevant test statistic, which is the, the, the energy residual. So you're, you're really just uh, summing over all the detectors of the network and all the pixels which are in a track, you just define this track a priori, and then you are quadratically summing the, the, the SNR uh, minus the, the SNR of the, of the model that you, you're you taking into consideration. And that's it. This is just, a, it's, a, it's a very naive and, and also robust way of, of looking at things. And here in the bottom, you see what happens. Basically, if you take the data of GW 0814 and you subtract as a model just the, uh, the, the, the two two modes, just, the, just the, the best estimate. In this case, we are using the, the max L of SUBNR before ROM, but you, you can use whatever model you want, and uh, provided that you just take the, the two two modes. And then it's what you can see what you're left with. There are some, of course, there are some pixels off uh, along the two two modes because there is some uh, inconsistency between the, the, the max likelihood sample and the Korean progression reconstruction. But uh, this is uh, it's not so important. You are going to sum up also those. But uh, what, what you really uh, should look at is uh, whatever is occurring on the three three truck and on the right there is the, the, the just just that the, those pixels basically you are summing up the snr of all these pixels and this is your test statistic for for the advance and of course you you, you can there, there are some free parameters here how large is the track how long is the track uh, and uh, when you start just before the merger because you don't want to go too close to the merger where everything is blurry. And, uh, but this can be optimized via some receiver operating characteristic curves starting uh, by using uh, injections. And um, okay, that, that, that's the, 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 the real uh, 
plot on, on, on well on the right there is some some examples of this uh, optimization where you see for different delta alpha what happens so it doesn't change so much uh, till when you get a large enough to include a more more um, uh, more trucks and then uh, it changes but basically it's very robust with respect to, to, to the possibility of choosing alpha of, of choosing delta alpha delta t and so on and so forth uh, and, Just and then, you have oh, one minute left, please. Okay, well, I, I, I'm, I'm almost done. So the, the red, uh, the red line here is the is the uh, almost eight is the energy residual, which is kind of uh, consistent with the SNR estimates by by PE runs, and the blue is is what we get by injecting tons and tons of uh, of uh, waveform which do not contain any any uh, uh, any higher order modes and gives you some kind of false alarm probability and the green instead is when we inject them and it gives in our sense some detection efficiency and so you can tune the detection efficiency to get better out this this the mode you want and and see how how well it fares against a, a null hypothesis and that's the, the the plot that was already a very similar one this is a, it's the one obtained uh, from the public posteriors and you see that the probability has a nice drop exactly at 1.5 which corresponds to the the 3 3 mode and the other dips are more like consistent with a one sigma or two sigma uh, errors so there, there is not a clear cut as it is. This is a seven to two minus three uh, in B value. So, okay, we, we repeat also for, for the other uh, 19 or four, 12, but here the evidences are uh, less, uh, yeah, it, it, it's less clean. Uh, there is something, but it's not so evident uh, at all for us. And so I, I, I will conclude just like saying that, that there is this 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 way this methodology which is fast and, and, and doesn't necessarily need to wait for the PE runs to complete to give a, a, a result. It, it is it works well for GW 19 or 814 for which there is a large SNR. Works less well with, 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 well it's a or when the mode is weak, but nevertheless, it's uh, some viable solution whenever you have odd events or whenever you want a, uh, uh, um, an early warning system for the presence of uh, uh, higher order modes and a paper is in proportion and done. Any questions? Thank you very much, Francesco, very interesting talk. Um, yes, uh, any questions for Dr. Salemi, either in the chat or blue hand up, please. Well, while people are thinking, um, I, I had a, a small one, which maybe is a bit naive, but can you, can you say anything um, about the sort of the physics of the, event as a whole by looking at the relative weights of the different higher order modes. Um, what, what sort of things can we, you know, like if the 3.3 is 27% stronger than the 4.4 or whatever, what sort of things can we, what sort of information can we extract from that? Well, that, 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 that was what I, what I was mentioning before. I, I think that for sure you, you, you can infer something about the geometry of the, the, the inclination. Then, uh, uh, it really depends on what you're looking for, I guess. This is if, if uh, other than that, if you want to about the physics of the of the, of the system itself, well, that that's uh, it depends. I, I mean, here I I showed you an example for 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 binary mergers, but which is what we are observing right now. But this doesn't need to be the case uh, uh, for. I mean, the method is general you can you can use for other stuff eventually so i guess my my 
my answer is, uh, well, it depends on what you're looking for. Yeah, and uh, you might have mentioned this already, I apologize, but um, what about things like testing uh, for departures from GR, are there particular yeah, sure, viral sure. modes? Yeah, 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 you, you, you're right. Uh, that, that, that's what I included in this unmodeled tests. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, it, 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 well, it's, it's, it, it, yeah, I, I, I apologize. I arrived a little bit late uh, with, uh, long with my presentation, but that, that was exactly that. I mean, in principle, you, you can use the very same methodology to, 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 to test for uh, deviation from models, any models. And so, yes, indeed. And, and I want to, uh, well, if I may, I want to underline that uh, whenever you use the, the PE runs, you are actually uh, when, when in, the, in the distribution pairs that you're seeing, you're actually marginalizing also automatically with respect to the posteriors of, uh, of the PE run. And mm -hmm. at the same time, the Gaussian deviation, which is around the, 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 the event itself. So you're there is no Gaussian noise. Uh, 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 no Gaussian noise uh, hypothesis here. We are really injecting around and see how uh, fluctuation around the event are, are scattering a little bit the, the events. At the same time, we are considering the, the entire full envelope of, of the, the entire full distribution of, of posteriors. So whenever we have a PE run, a, a confident PE run, we this, this result includes both of these two things. Yep. yep, yep, understood. Thank you very much. Um, that's great. And thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Dr. Marek Chapanchik, um, and he will be speaking about intermediate black holes. Marek. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Perfect. You can't so say anything. Yeah, let me share my screen. And uh, I'm calling from Florida and it's uh, the middle of the night. So you can see the light uh, <laughs> in my room. It's, uh, it's, it's 1 a.m. <laughs> so, yes, I was in that situation <laughs> only 12 hours so, ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can see your slides, and, but not and in full, full screen. Okay, so now it should be in full screen. So on full screen, but the presentation mode uh, here. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So, okay. So let, let me start. Uh, I'm a postdoc uh, uh, at University of Florida, and uh, I was involved. I'm involved uh, in LIGO for many years now, and uh, I was. Uh, uh, in charge of the online coherent web based analysis uh, in O3 uh, together with my colleague. And uh, uh, I will say more about uh, coherent web based later. And uh, probably Francesco already uh, covered, but I will give a reminder. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the first detection of uh, intermediate mass uh, black hole, uh, how it was detected with minimum assumptions. Uh, and um, how we analyze it. And uh, here on the screen, I'm putting uh, the, uh, the link and the references uh, to the paper uh, that I will be basically talking about. So first I will talk uh, about uh, what, are, what are we searching for, what are the burst searches, uh, then what is the algorithm that, uh, that we use. Uh, then I will sink into what analysis we perform, uh, uh, to detect uh, GW15 uh, on IP21 and uh, how it is uh, uh, how it was detected uh, and uh, um, how we analyze uh, the waveforms and then I will summarize uh, my talk. So before I go into uh, the details, uh, let me just quickly say uh, what are the intermediate mass uh, black holes. Uh, so in the mass range, uh, from one solar mass to millions of solar mass, uh, you have uh, three ranges. First is uh, up to 100 uh, solar, solar masses, 
And these are basically stellar mass black holes created uh, uh, by practically collapse uh, of, of, of the star. This is, uh, uh, these are in the size, these are the sizes uh, of the stars. And uh, people talk about uh, um, the, um, the upper, upper range of around 100 solar masses. And then we have the other range of supermassive black holes above uh, 100,000 solar mass. So, uh, sup uh, so these are very, very heavy black holes that are in the centers of the galaxies. And for those two stellar mass and supermassive black holes, we have the observation, observational evidence and now gravitational evidence uh, for stellar mass black holes that they exist. Uh, but there's a huge gap between and, uh, this, uh, and uh, the black holes in that range are basically intermediate mass black holes. So GW190521 is actually the very first uh, uh, confident detection of an intermediate uh, mass black hole. And uh, uh, this is my focus today. Um, in general, we don't know exactly what is the astrophysical origins of these intermediate mass black holes. Uh, can be some character measures, uh, some AGN disks, uh, maybe accretion. Um, so um, there's a lot of interesting uh, science that can be done with this uh, intermediate mass black hole, um, intermediate mass black holes. So um, let me tell what actually we are searching for um, and uh, what are actually the burst sources. Um, the binary black holes can be, um, um, uh, these are very short, the, these are short duration gravitational signals and um, uh, we are searching for them in low latency and uh, in the offline and uh, uh, in an offline analysis. Um, in the low latency, uh, we want to I get a rapid identification of a gravitational wave source as a gravitational wave burst um, to be able to send them to uh, to the astronomical community. Um, we have two search types for the burst sources. Um, one is the template based when we know exactly what we are searching for, and uh, um, we. Uh, and we are searching primary for the uh, black hole, binary black holes or black hole uh, mm, neutron star merger or uh, the systems of binary neutron stars. And uh, we have also uh, the shape of the waveform. And uh, prime examples uh, are uh, core collapse supernovae, but we can also have uh, uh, some um, binaries that are special. We can have a uh, very heavy binary black holes. We can have uh, eccentric bi binary black holes. And um, um, we cannot uh, predict uh, basically uh, all the source types. So uh, the coherent wave burst uh, that uh, Francesco was already talking about uh, uh, is the algorithm that uh, uh, is designed to detect uh, to a wide range of uh, gravitational wave bursts. Um, and um, it uses a very uh, simple, very minimal assumptions on the signal um, uh, morphology. Uh, for example, if we have a uh, binary black holes, uh, we assume that uh, the frequency grows over time. Um, and uh, for example, on the right plot, uh, you have uh, the very first uh, a snapshot of the very first detection of, uh, of the very first detected gravitational wave. And um, yeah, you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, the energy basically grows uh, uh, over time. The frequency of the signal grows over time. Uh, so within this uh, type of uh, minimal assumptions, uh, the algorithm detected uh, um, the very first gravitational wave, uh, the heaviest binary in uh, 0102 uh, 
run of LIGO Vivo. And now it detected the very first uh, uh, intermediate uh, mass uh, binary black hole. And also it detects uh, uh, several different other um, um, other gravitational waves together with the template-based searches. So um, it's not possible to design an algorithm that uh, is sensitive to all type of sources. But we, for binary systems, we make a simple observation. Um, we notice that uh, the frequency, the peak frequency of uh, the waveforms are proportional to one over total mass uh, of a system. And uh, we divided uh, our search for binary sources into a low mass search and high mass search uh, according to the peak frequency. Uh, and um, typically, IMBH sources are below 80 hertz, uh, while the stellar mass black holes are about above uh, 80 hertz. Uh, so we design uh, the algorithm, we design the selection cuts and uh, uh, all tuning to be able to um, be sensitive to these two uh, source types. And together we are sensitive to a wide range of uh, binary systems. So going to the GW190521, uh, in the online, in the low latency analysis, uh, the uh, CWB detected it with a significance of one per 25 years. And uh, this event uh, has very low peak frequency of around 60 hertz. And um, it doesn't, as you can see on the plot on the right, uh, it doesn't have a chirping structure as for a typical uh, binary system, as I was mentioned before. Um, and yet uh, signal was strong enough to be detectable. And uh, when we went uh, from online to offline analysis, when we analyzed uh, the data much more carefully, uh, we used um, uh, LIGO Livingstone and LIGO Hanford data to, um, uh, to calculate detection significance of this event. And uh, for analysis of the waveform, we also add uh, Virgo. So we did a uh, uh, time shift analysis uh, as, uh, as we do usually um, for uh, any type of searches of, with, so, with coherent waivers. Uh, we accumulated almost uh, 10,000 years of the background data and we found the false alarm rate of our event of uh, one per uh, almost 5,000 years. And we found only um, uh, two events that were more significant uh, than our event. And uh, one per 5,000 years shows that uh, it's a very significant event. So now when we analyze the waveform, we create so-called confidence belts. So uh, we are taking uh, uh, the um, parameter estimation, uh, the best uh, matching waveforms um, and we take the best matching waveforms from the uh, Bayesian inference uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, like thousands of them. We take around uh, randomly a, a, a thousand. Uh, we add them randomly to different uh, parts of the uh, detector noise. We reconstruct them, synchronize them, and uh, look how well coherent waves can reconstruct um, and this uh, um, different, uh, um, different, uh, different samples, uh, different mat best matching templates for this event. And uh, we used uh, two models and uh, uh, we find on this plot visually that the, our, uh, the, our reconstruction works pretty well. Uh, the events uh, uh, are reconstructed correctly by, by coherent waivers, but there are still some more small discrepancies. Uh, and we are, uh, we want to investigate it further. So uh, we do the same exercise for the, uh, in, in a frequency domain. And uh, we see some discrepancies in um, low frequencies, a little bit in, in other frequency ranges, 
uh, as well. So we see that uh, there is a, some disagreement, but uh, with uh, this analysis, uh, we actually don't do any quantitative statements. Um, we just uh, show visually how well uh, the coherent wave reconstruction fits uh, to the uh, reconstruction of, uh, um, of waveforms from certain, uh, um, certain models. So uh, we do the waveform overlap analysis uh, that provides a quantitative, st quantitative statement whether a waveform that we're analyzing uh, fits uh, the data. Uh, Hi, Mark, so, I just want to let you know about two minutes left. OK, thank you. Yeah, I have just two slides. Uh, so we, we are calculating for certain uh, templates. Uh, we calculate uh, uh, a scalar product uh, between that template and coherent variables reconstruction. And uh, if that overlap, waveform overlap is uh, equal to zero, then um, we have a mismatch between the two. Uh, but if we have a waveform overlap to be one, uh, we have a perfect agreement. So usually a maximum likelihood waveform uh, is assumed to be a best match template. Uh, so the waveform, so max L waveform uh, is usually assumed that uh, um, this is uh, our reference uh, waveform. And uh, we used two methods uh, to answer this, uh, this question, whether a um, uh, waveform model fits the data. In the first assumption, we yeah, assume that uh, max, uh, maximum likelihood uh, template um, is a good valid representation of GW190521. Uh, but there can be some biases uh, um, because uh, maybe some other um, waveforms uh, can be um, other best matching templates can be better representation. So we introduce uh, uh, the second method that uh, doesn't make this assumption. And uh, we say that all of these uh, best matching templates could be valid representation of GW190521. And um, uh, we are uh, in, uh, calculating uh, no distribution uh, that, that is, we take uh, the template, we reconstruct it, and we calculate the waveform overlap. And then we do uh, the same, uh, we calculate the waveform overlap with this uh, uh, best matching template, and uh, we look uh, where in that null plot uh, we have um, um, is, is situated uh, uh, that that number that uh, that number, and uh, on the right you can see the distribution of uh, uh, all these um, um, waveform overlaps from the null distribution, and then uh, the waveform uh, and then waveform overlap for the best matching template and our CWB reconstruction. And um, we calculate p-value uh, that, that is telling uh, uh, whether a model fits the data. It's basically a uh, number of uh, waveforms that have uh, worse uh, waveform overlap uh, than our uh, reconstruction of GW190521. And uh, we calculate the p-value for, uh, for numerical waveforms is around eight. And for the approximated um, model is around one. So it means that uh, the numerical waveforms fit actually uh, better to, to our model, uh, to our reconstruction. And um, yeah, the approximated uh, waveform a little less. We also have the second method uh, and uh, um, with the second method, uh, we obtain basically the same, the same results. So as a summary, um, so coherent wave was demonstrated that it can detect unexpected gravitational wave sources and uh, this intermediate mass black hole was unexpected. Um, our reconstruction agree with the Bayesian 
uh, inference. Um, uh, we calculate uh, how well the signal model fits our reconstruction and uh, uh, we quantify it. Uh, and we find that uh, numerical simulation waveform uh, agree better with data, with our reconstruction than uh, an approximated waveform. So thank you very much. And I'm, ha I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Marek. Uh, questions for Dr. Chapanchik? Uh, looking in the chat box. The hands up. Okay, so none. It's everything was perfectly clear. <laughs> Mark, thank you. No, I, I have a hand. I have um, a hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Sasha. I'm so sorry. Please go ahead. So, so, so I have a question about. So this is very interesting. Thanks for this talk. So I have a question about the last point because. Um, so you say that the numer the numerical relativity interpolations are better than than a model, but you've chosen a model which doesn't have higher modes and it doesn't have precision. That's um, correct. So and then also so there's right there are these issues that um, the NS gate it has a limited um, range of of parameter space coverage, and so then there has been some recent work uh, by different groups where where the were processing higher mode models with a larger um, parameter range. Uh, have been used, and then one finds different results and different posteriors. So have, have you been looking into that? Yeah, you you are referring to the later latest latest works. Um, yeah, that these are interesting. Uh, uh, so ba yeah, so basically, uh, they found uh, uh, much stronger involvement of the higher order modes, right? Uh, so yeah, we haven't been uh, uh, analyzing that. Uh, in this study, we actually consistent with uh, what uh, uh, Ligon, uh, Ligon and Virgo have, have found um, that the numerical simulations and our surrogate waveforms um, that include higher order models and precessions fit better than approximate this approximate that uh, doesn't have these effects. Uh, but uh, but this is this, you, you chose that you have chose the approximate which fits the which fits it less. I mean, there's there are many other approximates which have basically which are on the same level of inner surrogate that they have precession time modes. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. And uh, we are analyzing uh, like several different models. So this is um, I could say a demonstration that uh, the the method works. Uh, in the Bayesian analysis, uh, people usually compare two models. They are saying which model is more likely to be um, uh, to be correct. Uh, versus the other, but um, uh, they are not answering the question whether the, the model itself uh, uh, fits, uh, fits the data, if the model is, is, is correct. So with this method, uh, yeah, we are doing the comparison between two models. And uh, this is true that uh, we are analyzing like more up, uh, accurate and less mm -hmm. accurate models. Uh, but at the same time, we are answering the question whether um, a model, it's a uh, model itself uh, is is uh, is valid. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the question, and also Marek for the interesting talk. Um, our next speaker, and I please ask everybody okay. to keep thank an eye on much. the time. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jishnu Suresh, and he will be speaking about multiple components of the stochastic background. Um. Hello. So good morning. You can see my screen. Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, in, in in this presentation, like uh, I'll be I'll be uh, discussing some aspects of the component separation in the case of uh, an anisotropic gravitational wave background. Oops. Yeah. So, 
like uh, probably you already like heard from Mary as well as from Pat about the stochastic gravitational background searches and its Im implication in different directions. So a stochastic gravitational background is created by the superposition of like individually undetectable signals. And once we reach the sensitivity level such that like we will like eventually able to detect a gravitational wave background, then the bottleneck in claiming a detection will be uh, in relating the signals to the source that contributing to it. So if we filter the observed data uh, for each gravitational wave background component separately, we may end up in overestimating the amplitude of each background components and underestimate the error bars. So like the reason is that uh, the like one component is like, I mean, there are multiple components contributing to the same correlated signal. So I think like we will come to that in the uh, following slides. So which, which basically suggests that like, we don't have to like, I mean, we need to go beyond a, a single component analysis. That means like, you are basically observing, like you, you, you are having a correlated signal, which is coming from, or which is, which is basically contributed by different types of signals. And when you are doing the analysis, you, are, you assume that like the contributions to that correlated signal is coming from single component only. So we have to go beyond that kind of like analysis to better extract the amplitude of these individual uh, gravitational wave background components that contributing to the total background. So many methods have been proposed to disentangle these uh, components. Uh, so like, I mean, the, these, these methods are like uh, excellent for uh, estimating the parameters associated with different gravitational wave background models. However, uh, when you increase the number of components that you look for, like we have to basically deal with, uh, let's say a likelihood function in a multi-dimensional parameter space. So in such situations, uh, techniques like uh, Monte Carlo simulations or like uh, nested sampling will be necessary to estimate the model parameters like accurately. So which which base, which 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 suggests that like uh, going beyond let's say two or three components like uh, will be very challenging in terms of computational analysis. So like in 2016, uh, Parida et al. proposed efficient information metrics based method to jointly estimate the gravitational wave background components. That means it, it, it takes into account the covariance between different uh, gravitational wave background components that contribute into the total uh, background. So in, 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 this, in this work, like we are basically extending this idea to an anisotropic stochastic gravitational wave background and how we can separate out uh, like the each individual components that contributing to the total anisotropy. Okay, so some preliminaries. So since the stochastic gravitational background is individually undetectable, but can detect as a collectivity through their uh, common influence on uh, multiple detectors. So we, we, we basically, what we basically do is that we cross correlate detector output in shorter time segments, assuming that uh, geographically separated detectors will not have any correlated noise. And to, to kind of like look for the uh, anisotropy, we generally uh, use the gravitational wave radiometer techniques to map, like, I mean, essentially to map this anisotropy that exists in the, like in the universe. So, yeah, so, so like, I mean, since, since, uh, since, since the, since the background components, like, I mean, cannot be detected individually, I mean, we can basically explain explain the stochastic gravitational background uh, statistically in terms of like a dimensionless uh, energy density parameter as given in, like in, in, in equation one here. So, uh, and it, it's basically a function of like frequency and sky pattern since uh, here, like we are concentrating more on the, uh, the anisotropic behavior of the gravitational background sky. So like, 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 like in, in, to proceed in this direction, what we do is that we assume that uh, we can factorize the gravitational wave strain power, that's the, this, the PF omega, into frequency and sky direction dependent functions. So here this H of F uh, describes the spectral shape 
and the p omega describes the angular distribution of the power that means like how the how the source contributing to the to the total uh, background in terms of like its frequency dependency and in terms of its spatial distributions so like generally we assume like this h of f to follow some kind of like uh, power law models so like once we have this uh, now we can basically filter the correlated data by assuming a fiducial uh, model for the signal spectral shape h of f that means this is something similar to like the match filtering kind of analysis that means like we, we will be matching to a fiducial model uh, or a fiducial uh, model for the signal spectral shape h of f and see how well uh, it is agreeing with the this particular assumption so the optimal way to do such filtering is given by the so called optimal filtering that is shown in the equation like 3 here so the optimal filter gives i mean it, it it is basically do it in this way like it 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 weigh the observed uh, cross correlation data with respect to the frequencies which agree to the expected uh, expected signal spectrum h of f and it deviates the frequencies that corresponding to large detector noise so this is how this is kind of somewhat similar to the match filtering in the sense that i mean we are basically matching towards the expected fiducial model h of f so this is how a single component analysis that means we are basically assuming there is one component characterized by this h of f and do the filtering to look for the uh, corresponding gravitational wave background component so so the question is that like uh, how to extract if there are, there are like multiple components so just like like we showed in the like previous slide i mean the the function p of omega which is characterized by h of n like the the spectral shape and the spatial distribution let us consider the case where there are multiple components that means there are multiple spectral shape of the background h alpha f where alpha denotes the spectral index that means corresponding to individual source components and in that case uh, we can uh, rewrite the equation 2 in terms of as a, a summation over this different spectral shape shape of the background that's like contributing from multiple uh, sources and like in in that way we can we can we can write the likelihood function to do to to estimate this background in 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 this way where uh, we use the shorthand to like make things as like i mean simple and the corresponding solution of this like likelihood the maximum likelihood estimator for this particular p will be given in equation 6 where like gamma is the corresponding fission information matrix and x is the the observed map through the antenna pattern function of the sky that means this is this this is generally known as the dirty map where you are basically convolving with the detector response function so like if we expand the dirty map that we obtained in terms of different i mean like if we expand it in like detail for example you can see that the dirty map which describes as like h alpha f which basically suggests that it has the contribution from different spectral shapes and the corresponding fission information matrix will be uh, a combination of like different h alphas and h betas that means uh, the fission information matrix encodes the covariance between the different spectral shapes so like maybe I, like if i explain it further like it is basically the noise uh, weighted in the product of the spectral shapes so this matrix will tell you what sort of covariance there is between different spectral shapes and the components that creates the uh, the, the gravitational wave background so typically in the uh, lvk stochastic analysis we consider three spectral shapes that's like alpha 0 to y3 and 3 which three three of them depending on different types of sources and if we assume that there are three spectral shapes we can rewrite the equation like the the previous uh, this convolution equation in terms of a matrix multiplication in this way where the the central term with re, which which represents the this this 3 by 3 matrix here is the coupling matrix which gives us the covariance between the spectral shapes and since u u prime is there which basically describes the covariance between the pixels as well so like then the maximum likelihood solution which gives us the individual components could be uh, rewrite in this way in this particular equation so let us consider like what happens 
when we do it for an isotropic background. So here you can see that there is like, like in detector one, we consider like a wide gravitational background and another one is the BNS background and a combination of that and same, same thing in detector two. And here in this table, you can see that if we use single index component, that means you assume that like the background is dominated by let's say a wide gravitational background and try to estimate the corresponding, uh, like let's say the like that particular component, you can see the expect the, the, the signals are getting overestimated for both the cases and like expected was like, uh, like this value. And you can see that here it is like getting overestimated. But when we account for this, the earlier joint index analysis, that means considering both signals together, it recovers properly. So the idea is that how it will look like in the anisotropic case that we discussed in the, like the previous slide. So to, do, to, to study- about four oh, minutes left. Oh yeah, thanks. So to, 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 to get an idea of like how this thing will look like in an anisotropic case, we, we, we went for like an injection studies where we consider three like kind of injections where this is for alpha, like, like, a, like a dipole like structure for alpha zero and a, a Milky Way like pattern for alpha three, oh, sorry, alpha two by three and a small patch in the sky for alpha three. So the combined source will be like this. And basically we are looking for a source pattern like, like a, an anisotropic background like this. And if we create the corresponding coupling metrics, like from the fission information metrics for considering each alphas, it will look like this. So the thing is that like in, in, a, in a recent study, we showed that like assuming the uh, current detector sensitivity, we can actually uh, neglect the contributions from the off diagonal components of the pixel to pixel covariance metrics. And, and we can go with the diagonal elements of the uh, Fisher metrics. That means we are ignoring the pixel to pixel correlation. That means this coupling metrics here will be, we will become an, a diagonal element for in this particular case. So just to get an idea of like how the component will look like, we consider let's say 100th pixel in a particular uh, Helpix, uh, the solution of n side 16, and it will it will resemble in this way. That means each component re represents the, I mean this particular matrix represents the covariance between the spectral shapes, and with with the help of this we will try to sort out like how this thing will look like. Okay, so. Here in the top, it is the dirty map. That means the, the observed map. And here we are showing the, uh, the map from the single index clean map. And here it, from the multi-index clean map. So it is pretty clear from the image itself that, or from the sky map itself that the semi-clean map fails to recover the sky patterns. And it ac actually overestimate the corresponding intensity. On the other hand, the multi-index clean map like recover things like in the, both in terms of spectral, uh, in terms of spectral shape and in terms of like the, the, the distribution of the sky, both of them are recovered pretty well here. So just to uh, quantify like this re reconstruction, we actually went for a like normalized mean square error where like from, from this particular estimator, you can understand like how well the recovery is, like a better recovery will be indicated by the value of the NMSC being close to zero. So this, for this particular one particular case, like we computed the NMSC and you can see that, like, I mean, if, if it is not that clear from the, uh, uh, the, from the sky map, like quantitatively, we can see that like here, the sing, single index analysis versus uh, joint index analysis where sin, single index, sorry, the joint index is like performing way better than the corresponding single index. So just to make sure that we are not seeing these things like by chance, we performed like thousands noise simulations and we performed the same injection study and the recovery and try to see how the NMSC for each recovery will look like. So here you can see that uh, the NMSC where the purple one shows the join index is always better than that of the single index. And we, we further like check that with the different like same uh, thousand simulations for different cases. So here you can see like the estimated amplitude for this particular case where we, uh, the histogram basically shows like how it will, it is distributed for single index and joint index and the corresponding variance and the, and the difference between the upper limit and the injections. So if we consider this alpha two by three case, we can see that a considerable amount of the point in the histogram fall under the negative region. So this indicates that 
even though the single index estimate appears to provide a stronger upper limit it violates the requirement for a 95 percentage confidence upper limit at least in certain generic cases where more than five percentage pixels i mean here it is 11 percentage upper limit is like lower than the injected value so this 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 basically suggests that even if the detectors are not sensitive enough to detect a stochastic gravitational wave background the joint index multi component estimator provides safer upper limits when one cannot ignore the existence of more than one component uh, so like i can just uh, like keep this summary slide here uh, so basically it basically suggests that if you filter the data for the gravitational background component separately we overestimate the amplitude of each gravitational wave component and underestimate the corresponding error bar and we have shown that like estimates and the upper limits can get severely biased in the single index analysis when the actual signal is close to or more than the detectable limit and the joint analysis accurately separates and estimates the backgrounds with different spectral shapes and different sky distribution with no major bias okay obviously this comes at the cost of increased variance yeah i think that's all thank you okay thank you very much um Vishnu. uh Questions, please. Uh, Pat, please. Hi. Um, thanks for thanks for presenting this, uh, just new. I was just wondering. I just wanted to to try to understand a little bit better the what you call the semi-clean method. So on slide eight, I think it was, you discussed um, uh, so, like removing the off diagonal elements. Is, am I right in understanding that what you're doing here is for say the alpha equals zero, alpha equals zero block of that coupling matrix, you remove off diagonal elements, but you still allow correlations between the different spectral indices when you do your inversion? Is that a, a fair? Yeah, so yeah, that, that's 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 correct. So, for example, let's consider like we are looking at the sky. Oh, sorry, looking at the sky, and let's say we are looking at the hundredth pixel. Then there 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 always exists the correlation between different uh, spectral shapes, but we basically ignore the uh, the corresponding pixel to pixel covariance. I mean, is that clear, Pat? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much um, for the question, Pat, and thank you, Vishnu, for your talk. Uh, the next speaker is Yuan Hao Zhang, um, and he will be presenting about the search for Scorpius X1. Thank you, Yuan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Milados. Um, and my name is uh, Yan Hao Zhang. I'm a, a postdoc at Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics. I'm uh, really happy to have this opportunity. And thanks for Dr. Milados and the co host to uh, take care of everything. Uh, so today I'm going to give some uh, updates on the, the recent effort to search for gravitational wave from Scorpius X1. Um, so this is today's outline. I will start with some brief introduce and uh, uh, on the SCOX1 and then uh, uh, talk about our O2 search and uh, a prior study uh, using the spin evolution model to study the neutron star. Um, so the SCOX1 is a low mass X3 binary and uh, consistent consists with the neutron star accreting from its uh, low mass companion. Uh, the uh, Buston, uh, who uh, trying to uh, argue why the neutron star seems to stop at 300 hertz. Uh, he proposed that the gravitational wave could play an important role uh, in this procedure. And uh, he also uh, proposed uh, a temperature sensitive ejection capture in the crust and create uh, enough uh, density variation and, and uh, have uh, enough quadruple, uh, quadruple moment to give a rise to gravitational wave. Uh, if the uh, accretion torque is balanced by the gravitational wave torque. You can uh, estimate the string strength to be proportional to the square root of uh, 
a volumetric flux of the neutron star. Uh, as go X1 is the brightest one after the sun and uh, extra solar, it's an extra solar source, of course. Uh, so make it extra interesting. So you can estimate the strength of the, the gravitational emit from SCO X1 uh, at order of 10 to negative 26, which is likely to be uh, detectable uh, in an advanced uh, detector error, which is now. Uh, so that suggests GOX1 is a very promising continuous wave source for ground-based detectors. Um, so on this slide, I'm showing the parameters of a GOX1. So it's a, a directed a source, means we know the, direct, uh, the sky location of the SCOT X1, while we don't have a very clear uh, information about the spin rate. And it's as SCOX1 is not detected as a POSA or the a QPO the directly linked to its spin frequency. Um, so we don't know whether this one is spinning up or spinning down. And uh, on the other hand, we also know there's a phenomena called spin wandering, where essentially the, uh, the neutron star is go through a certain uh, 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 random spinning up and spinning down. Uh, they will give us some jittering in the, in the phase evolution. So it will limit our ability to use fully coherent method. Uh, the binary system has a 44 degree uh, inclination from observation. Uh, as this one is in the binary system, we need to uh, know to model its binary motion in order to perform a gravitational wave search. Uh, so the parameters I showed three, the three most important parameters I'm showing here. Uh, they are uh, fairly well constrained, while um, uh, still need to have cover it and with uh, cover the parameter space with a very fine grid. Um, so since GOX1 is a very interesting source, uh, we do a O2 search um, targeted at this uh, at this specific sky location. Uh, this work was was done with my uh, colleagues Mary Sandra Patrick Krishnan and uh, Anna Watts and the published on the journal earlier this year. Uh, so we cover the frequency band 40 to 180 Hertz and uh, all possible X and ion region. Uh, the timing setting node and the PR, uh, the uh, period of the binary is covered in by uh, three sigma. And uh, uh, the time setting has been shifted to middle of the O2 and uh, uh, the uncertainty has been expanded. Uh, we used the O2 data it's, uh, in 2017, basically eight month data from uh, Livingston Hanford. The method we are using is a model-based cross-correlation method adapted from the, uh, from the stochastic background search here from the previous talk. Uh, while we use a model to, uh, we, we use, a, it's, it's a model base, we can uh, co coherently combine data in the same on different detector. Uh, in a maximum allowed time difference, and uh, 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 and the tr uh, and the, you can use the, the maximum allowed time lag to control the sensitivity to trade off the uh, computing cost and the sensitivity. Uh, this method has been used in O1, uh, and uh, something new about that is we are uh, implemented with uh, a resampling technology where you basically reshuffle the data and to make them look monotonic. So you can simply use a fast Fourier transform uh, and take advantage of this uh, algorithm to make this more efficient. So thanks to this uh, improvement, we managed to uh, go to a pretty uh, long coherence time. Uh, we use a single coherence time everywhere to, of 19 hours. Uh, if you compare with all one search, the previous one is roughly uh, three hours. Um, so we only focus on near constant signals and uh, the tolerance is for if that's smaller than uh, two times 10 to negative 13 Hertz per second. Uh, so you won't lose too much uh, signal to noise ratio. Uh, so we uh, do the search and uh, uh, post-process the result. I see many candidates appears, but they are not independent. Group them into 32 clusters and uh, find the correlation of the, of the group to the known lines. And uh, for the rest, we uh, do a consistent check to test whether they behave like a real signal while uh, none of them uh, passed. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have detection yet. So we have to, uh, set, we set up limits by injection in every half-hertz band. 
So on this plot, it's a marginalized 95% upper limit from our search and the previous searches. Uh, you see the uh, this uh, the green dots are the uh, Viterbi search who uh, use a, a hidden Markov chain to take care of the spin wandering, uh, which is less model dependent and more robust. Uh, the previous uh, most sensitive search was the O1 uh, cross cross method uh, search. Uh, we um, our sensitivity uh, has improved the previous best result by a factor of 1.8, uh, getting close to the top balance limit while we are still not that yet. We will expand there another, say 1.8 a factor to get to the top balance limit. Uh, so we only focus on 4280 hertz. The previous um, search has they actually uh, search much higher frequencies. Um, so by now, we're just as basically assuming the neutron star is kinetical and uh, there's no magnetic field on that. Um, so, um, which is not necessarily true if you have the um, a few times 10 to, 10 to 8 Gauss, then you will expect that the creating actually could happen set a, a alpha radius where the, 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 the alpha radius is greater than the, the greater than the radius neutron star, then you can have a greater lever arm. You can expect uh, a larger gravitational wave emission. Uh, so we place a uh, up limit here by assuming the neutron star have a magnetic field of 10 to 9 Gauss. Um, so the, the arbitrary inclination angle of limit is still above this. Uh, while this system uh, is ha it has a 44 degree uh, inclination, so it is very natural to assume the neutron star spin axis is perpendicular to this plane. So we have assumed the neutron star has this inclination and the, do another sets of injection and get the new up limits. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it looks more op optimistic as the our 44 degree up limit has break the top balance limit on the neutron star surface between uh, 67.5 to 131.5 hertz. And also uh, for all the Alpha radius of limits just uh, break it in all the frequency band we searched. Uh, so this on this slide is just a translation from previous result by assuming the uh, neutron uh, pre previous uh, upper limit by assuming the, the moment inertia is canonical value. And you see we are uh, exploring a few times ten to eight region, which is uh, likely to be supported uh, by the neutron star uh, crust. And so it's getting more physical. Um, so if we relax our assumption for the neutron star is uh, canonical, we can actually put some constraint on the configuration of the neutron star and the magnetic field on it. Um, so on, in this shaded area, so every point in that corresponds to a mass radius combination. Um, if, they, if the neutron star is in top balance, uh, they should emit stronger gravitational wave than our upper limit since we don't have detection. So we can exclude this region. For this allow region, so for those, um, uh, the M diff diff we plot a few um, uh, uh, equation of state here. For each MR, they buy, the neutron star by itself doesn't emit strong gravitational wave enough, but if the neutron star has a magnetosphere, uh, then you can expect it emits stronger gravitational wave. So you can uh, hence uh, put on a, a upper limit on magnetic field. So on the upper plot uh, for each M and uh, corresponding R at given equation of state, uh, you can place a maximum magnetic field on that. Oh, uh, I should use this full screen mode. And uh, uh, so, um, and then you can always uh, play a, uh, uh, use this, uh, you can always play this constraint for every place you've set up a limit. And uh, it's a little cartoon to show how does this changes and uh, with the sensitivity and the best sensitivity rate roughly happens at 96 hertz. And you can see the magnetic field is moving up and down given by different sensitivity. Um, so overall, uh, it's, uh, I have mentioned all the point here. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a novel way to constrain the parameters of a neutron star and uh, to link it with continuous wave searches. So of course the future always brighter. If you uh, if you see the Andre's talk on Wednesday, who uh, present a few other approaches for the Scott SX one uh, in the the there will be uh, we're looking forward to for the future. Um, so um, and so in the O two we basically just uh, use the same coherence time all the time. 
uh, while uh, it's not likely to be the optimal setup as uh, the mean at all they, they use, they basically take all the information by the, from the source from the, and the all the information of the detector and the understanding of the uh, search pipeline, put them together. You can uh, maximize over detection probability at limited computing power. Basically you place different sensitivity in different uh, parameter space. Um, so for SCO X1, you can do something similar. The orbital parameters, you can simply use the astrophysical priors while we don't know the, where the frequency should look at and whether the neutron star is spinning up or not, and how the elliptic uh, as a function of the frequency. So that's the motivation of our uh, prior study. So we use a simple uh, spin evolution model to study the SCO X1. Um, it's, uh, yeah, the- Two minutes, please. No problem. Uh, so the, the model is presented here. You just have the accretion uh, torque and uh, magnetic dipole radiation and gravitational wave emission. The magnetic dipole radiation is ignorable, but we just keep it there anyway. Uh, and the accretion torque is uh, slightly different from the, uh, pre uh, from the uh, talk balance limit, uh, talk balance argument. Uh, the only the difference is has an extra minus term here, uh, which is uh, uh, effectively a fascinating a factor where essentially when the magnetosphere radius is greater than co-rotating co -rotating radius then the accreting, accretion doesn't really uh, spin this neutron star any faster, but just decrease it. Uh, so uh, yeah, you need to know all these uh, uh, parameters and you can derive the mole initial radius from the uh, equation of state. Um, so, okay, since the time is running out, we uh, just have this, we explore as much as possible in the electricity and magnetic field. And you just draw an initial mass and assign an initial spin frequency and uh, assume a certain uh, accretion, uh, accretion rate. And then you would consider all the matter accreted on a neutron star and they will, the moment initial also increase. And then you just evolve the neutron star until a certain point. Uh, so in, uh, after this integration, we know the, uh, the, the, the result here. So in the h strand, h frequency plane, you see that in lower frequency, it's actually emitting stronger than the uh, torque balance limit, while at higher frequency, it's a bit lower. Uh, so our uh, arbitrary inclination angle in, uh, is uh, arbitrary, yeah, upper limit is not uh, sensitive enough to detect anything, while the uh, 44 degree is, uh, has some, can explore some physical region. Um, so, and most of them are, uh, if you uh, are in talk balance, if you uh, set a, lo a lower limit at five times centimeter 27, and most of them doesn't have a very significant spin up, spin down. Uh, so this, I'm just showing the, uh, the parameter space can be explored uh, in the for of course, in the future it'd be more. Uh, okay, I'm basically, uh, okay, skipping this. And uh, eventually you can uh, play, uh, put some constraint on your, uh, on your on your result and finally give the you know the uh, frequency distribution. So here we just set an arbitrary uh, up limit on the mass accreting on a neutron star. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, we uh, this is uh, just method we can you can uh, do to get the distribution you want to have to put into the optimization procedure. And uh, uh, so luckily the most promising neutron stars are included them, and we basically. Uh, investigate them in the O2 search. Uh, so the with the search sensitivity is, is going to be much better. Uh, well, not really much better, but better. Uh, a factor of one to two in O3 and O4. So we are exploring the uh, more astrophysical meaningful parameter space. Uh, so I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, okay, we have Two minutes for questions, please. Uh, while people are thinking, I've got a little one um, about page 19, actually, which you've got on the screen at the moment. Um, with the, so normally the torque balance limit corresponds to omega equals omega Kepler um, in the notation that you used on a previous slide. Mm -hmm. um, so the torque balance limit is just 
one particular uh, combination of omega and omega K. So on this, on page 19, when you're comparing those things together and saying that they go above the torque balance limit, can you, can you speak a bit more? What, what do you mean by that exactly? Um, so uh, in the, yeah, okay. In the, say, uh, uh, the Bilsen's uh, e uh, equation, the torque balance limit. So there's actually uh, no, this omega, K, it doesn't have this minus term here. So they basically just have the, the first term. So you're just equating the uh, uh, accretion torque equals to gravitational wave. So, so you can get strain stress level. Uh, while in, our, in, in this case, we consider the, uh, also, yeah, so yeah, sorry, okay. What I mean by it's above that because the, we consider the magnetospheric radius instead of just assume the neutron star, uh, accretion happens on neutron star surface. So that's basically the reason why it's uh, spinning faster uh, at uh, above the talk balance level. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, look, and I agree with that. I, I think I expressed myself a bit um, badly. What, what I mean is that the, uh, you can have the, the accretion torque be negative um, yeah, yeah. when omega is you know, bigger than omega k, for example. So um, then you would never have, like in that limit, you would never have torque balance because both the gravitational wave torque and the accretion torque would be negative. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, right. yeah. Cool, all right, um, thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, so, um, Thank you for the, the excellent talk, Dr. John. Uh, the next speaker is Alex Kerrin, and he will be telling us about um, constructing mountains on neutron stars. Perfect. Uh, Alex, uh, you might be muted, I can't hear you. Sorry, whoops. Uh, all right, can everyone hear me now? Yes, very clearly. And we can see it. Good. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Karen. I'm a PhD student at the University of Melbourne with Andrew Malatos and Andy Martin. And today I'll be talking about a model for neutron star mountain creation. So it's a very brief overview on the topic, as most people are here like are likely familiar with. Neutron stars are extremely dense supernova remnants with rotational periods approaching as short as a single millisecond. On these mountains, we expect to see, sorry, on these stars, we expect to see mountains. And by mountains, I mean the very broad category of deviations from axis symmetry. However, uh, these mountains have yet to be observed. We expect to be able to see them through the continuous um, emission of gravitational waves. However, it has also been suggested that the events that create mountains, or are at the very least connected to the size of mountains, uh, may also be responsible for transient events, such as glitches. And for those unfamiliar, glitches are short, sudden, as of yet, uh, unexplained small optics in the rotational frequency of some pulsars. Um, and today we're just considering the case of isolated spinning down stars. Now the literature in this area will generally place limits on the ellipticity by considering uh, the largest possible mountain that can exist on a neutron star before it collapses or cracks or in some case cannot be supported by the crust anymore. And then it will consider like the largest possible deformation to the crust in this way and calculate the ellipticity like that. However, this is a um, overly optimistic in our opinion uh, approach to the problem. It's unlikely that mountains will form in such a uh, form in such an arrangement as to maximize ellipticity. And it's unlikely that or well, it's not guaranteed that they will approach that limit in the first place in the isolated case. Uh, so that leads us to attempt to create a more realistic model. So in this model, we're considering an 
isolated star. So there's no binary partner, there's no accretion. It's just born by itself and it lives out its life by itself. We're also considering the case where the magnetic field is weak. Uh, you can consider the case where the magnetic field is strong or where the, there's strong decay in the magnetic field and that does um, have impacts on the crustal evolution, but we're not considering that case. Uh, and that leaves us with spin down as the sole force um, responsible for the dynamics of this system. And as an additional uh, simplifying assumption, we're considering just a two component star. So there's a solid brittle crust and there's a superfluid core. Uh, so when I said the driving force um, is spin down, I should elaborate. So when the star is born, it's born spinning at some initial angular frequency omega, and it will be born oblate because there's a uh, there's centrifugal forces and there's gravitational forces, and the equilibrium shape they uh, uh, demand is that you have a oblate star. Um, then, as the star ages, it will lose angular frequency. Um, we in this model, suppose that it's an electromagnetic spin down, though it's rather agnostic and you can have other, other means of spin down. And as it loses angular momentum, it will, uh, the centrifugal force will decrease. So the shape of the star will tend towards being more spherical. Now the superfluid core, um, being a fluid, cannot support shear stresses or shear forces, so it just moves. But the crust, being a solid, can support the shear, uh, shear forces so it also moves, but it builds up a mechanical strain as a result. So then we have to ask, how do we model that spin down deformation? And to do this, we're using the schema developed by Franco, Lincoln, Epstein in their 2000 paper, Quaking Neutron Stars. Um, and the mathematics is quite in depth and we don't have time to go into it today, but very briefly speaking, they consider a Lagrangian perturbation associated with a small uh, decrement in the angular velocity uh, to the uh, centrifugal mechanical gravitational equilibrium. And uh, via applying some boundary conditions that we don't have time for, um, you can, for a given small spin down, you can derive the deformation vectors. Uh, and for those unfamiliar with deformation mechanics, if you have an initial infinitesimal volume element dv initially at position r, then under spin down, it will be moved from r to r plus u. Um, and here, like here is how r is defined in their schema. Uh, a, b, capital A, and capital B are defined by the boundary conditions, and p2 is just the second Legendre polynomial. So what this means is that if we know the initial state of the star we can describe its entire elastic evolution through spin down through its entire life. However, that is, the, that is modeling the elastic deformation due to spin down. We still have to model the plastic deformation due to mechanical failure, the crust cracking. And we do this by making use of a cellular automaton. So we define, um, we define our star and we break up the crust into a large number of discrete cells. And each cell, we track the position, R, the current strain, gamma, and the breaking strain, sigma, throughout the evolution of the system. And then we, so to begin, we initialize the system spinning at some omega. Uh, for our system, we chose 800 hertz, but it can vary. Um, and with some initial uh, ellipticity, sorry, not ellipticity, some initial oblateness. Um, and we assume it's initially unstrained, um, assuming that it has just been born and just cooled. Then we uh, decrement the angular velocity. Um, again, we are assuming a electromagnetic spin down, though it is ultimately rather agnostic. Um, and this, for this decremented velocity, you can calculate using Franco, Lincoln, Epstein's schema, you can calculate the deformation well, vectors, so sure. where every uh, crustal cell is moved to, and the strain, the mechanical strain that builds up in every cell as a result of that deformation. And in principle, you can just continue to do that until the star is spun down. But what you find is eventually, uh, locally, the strain of a cell will exceed its breaking strain, which means you have a mechanical failure and we need to create a model for that. Uh, we are taking advantage of the cellular automaton to do that modeling. 
So here, consider this is a um, zooming in of just a meridional cross section, so a meridional cross section of the star. This light blue is to represent the fluid core, and these blocks are just the cell, the crustal cells, and we're considering some failed cell I. So the first step in the failure uh, routine is that you relax the failed cell in question by fraction A, where A is a number between zero and one. Uh, this is to represent in a real material when a real local volume fails, it's no longer capable of supporting uh, its um, load, so it releases some amount of strain. The next step is to is a nearest neighbors interaction. When the cell in question fails, or when the local volume of material fails, it cannot bear um, the same load that it used to, so its neighbors need to pick up the slack, so to speak. Um, so the amount of strain they are under increases. And the strength of this nearest neighbors interaction is again parameterized by a number between zero and one. And this is essentially the strength of distribution. Then uh, the next cell, and perhaps the key point of this model is, uh, what we, is how we deform the crust. So some fraction of strain uh, has left the failed cell in question as it relaxes. Some fraction of that fraction has gone into adjacent cells in a nearest neighbors interaction, but there's some fraction of strain that is as of yet unaccounted for. Um, this strain, which corresponds to an energy via the stress strain relation, uh, we say does work against the gravitational centrifugal potential. It does plastic work on the crust deforming it. Uh, now, when I say it does plastic work, that's not uh, one to one. Um, because it's plastic work rather than elastic work, some amount is lost as heat. Um, in our case, we say 90%. Um, historically, uh, this, it's just been convention to assume that uh, the fraction of plastic work lost as heat is 90%. Uh, however, there have been more in-depth calculations for terrestrial materials, but they're still at least semi-empirical and very challenging. So we went with convention and stated that 90% of plastic work is lost as heat. And 10% of the remaining energy will move the center of mass of the cell against the local potential, thus creating a mountain. Um, in step four, you, we reset the breaking strain of the cell. And in step five, you can just continue this process synchronously across the crust until every cell is subcritical. Um, and at which point you are ready to resume decrementing the angular velocity um, continuous, continu and continuing this whole process until the star is totally spun down. Uh, what this means is that we now have a schema that allows us to know the position of every piece of the crust throughout the star's entire lifetime in a way that accounts for both uh, elastic spin down and plastic crustal failure. Um, which Okay, so now we have our model, we need to understand what can we learn from this model. Uh, the first thing we looked at was uh, the probability distribution of uh, events uh, in connection with the transient ideas that people have suggested. Um, one of the first things we noticed is that the shape, sorry, the, this PDF is not simply qualitatively, is not simply quantitatively affected by the uh, behavior of the crust, it's also qualitatively effective. Um, and by which I mean these tails. So if you have a very uh, strongly relaxing crust in the red and the blue, then you have a very tightly packed PDF. But if you have a weakly relaxing crust, so when a cell fails, it keeps most of its strain, uh, you, have a, you have these tails. Um, and this is indicative of like avalanches or cascade type um, events in cells. Like one cell fails and it knock, has a knock on process to many other cells. Um, and this is quite interesting because it would imply that if you have some way of measuring the size of star quakes um, in large numbers, then you could qualitatively, so you could infer the uh, strength of relaxation of neutron star crust under failure conditions. Uh, the next thing we looked at was size waiting time correlations. So that is, if you have a large event, does that mean the waiting time, like the time until the next event is longer? Is there a relation between how large an event is and how long until the next one? And this was motivated by similar investigation into glitches. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, glitches are short, small, 
uh, sudden as yet unexplained upticks to pulsar rotation frequency. Um, people have suggested that the cause of glitches, um, though there are other suggestions, it had may be connected to star quakes or crustal failure events. And given that we are mod modeling crustal failure events, we saw fit to make our own investigation. Uh, what we find is that there is very strong evidence for a weak correlation. So if you have a failure event, um, the larger it is, the on average longer you will be waiting until the next event. But this correlation is fairly weak. And this is due to cells being, failures being still ultimately localized. Um, they will be larger, they'll be larger and involve more cells, the larger they are, and thus extend the um, wipe out, so to speak, the closest to failure cell more often. But a lot of the time, if you have a large failure, uh, the next failure will just occur from some place on the opposite side of the star. So we have a weak correlation. Uh, next thing we looked at was when in the star's life do these events occur? Uh, and what we find is that, as you would expect, the star is born spinning very quickly, and so it spins down very quickly early on. So most of the strain builds up, build up, and most of the events occur early on in the star's life. Uh, however, um, interestingly, we, we found that failures do occur less and less frequently, but they keep occurring for nearly the star's entire life. So we would expect even very, very old stars to have the occasional uh, crust, crustal failure event. And then uh, almost lastly, but perhaps most interestingly, is if we know the position of every element of the crust at all points in time, then we can calculate the uh, ellipticity of the neutron star at every point in time. Um, and what we find is the ellipticity behavior over time. Unlike with the um, event size probability distribution functions, uh, the shape of this curve is very similar across parameter space. Um, there is an initially a Initially at zero because the star hasn't failed yet, but when it does, it rapidly increases due to failure events happening very quickly early in the star's life. But as the rate of spin down slows, failure events happen less often, and it uh, peters out. Uh, we find a maximum ellipticity of, of order 10 to the minus seven, approximately. However, keep in mind this is an upper bound for a very strongly relaxing crust. Um, it's my opinion that this is very, this is rather unlikely, and I would expect to see a wave strain um, a few orders of magnitude lower, more like 10 to the minus nine uh, range, I think is reasonable based on this model. This, it's unlikely a neutron star exists in this region of parameter space. Uh, next, if we have the ellipticity and we also know the um, frequency, then we, it's straightforward to calculate the wave strain. And similarly, we find that uh, the shape of the curve is qualitatively similar, whatever the crustal parameters, whatever the nature of the crust. Um, it's just a scaling because the crustal parameters control, uh, among other things, the size of the, mount the mountains that form and thus the ellipticity and thus the wave strain. Um, what we find here is that very early on the star's life, uh, the rapidly increasing ellipticity dominates the behavior, but eventually as spin down slows, uh, the decaying frequency becomes a dominant term and the wave strain, of course, tends to zero. Um, we find that because these two effects are just determined by the rate of spin down, uh, the peak, the time of peak ellipticity is independent of the crustal parameters. And it's consistently between approximately five and 10 spin down times, uh, spin down time scales. Um, and we find again, a maximum ellipticity um, which is a little bit lower than most of the estimates of uh, less than 10 to the minus 27. Um, okay, so in conclusion, uh, we have a maximum ellipticity of around 10 to the minus seven, but this is very much an upper bound, and, but still slightly, uh, a little bit lower than most of the literature estimates, or more around 10 to the minus six. Um, similarly, we have a lower wave strain, which is um, again, an upper bound, but again, lower than most of uh, the literature estimates. Uh, we should find that even very old isolated uh, neutron stars should occasionally experience crustal failure events. Um, and we find that the shape of the event of the star quake uh, PDF of event size should be qualitatively different depending on the crustal uh, relaxation parameters. Um, thank you for listening. Um, are there any questions?
Uh, thank you very much, Alex, for a very clear talk. Uh, we have two minutes for questions, please, either in the chat box or the hands up. Let me just make that. Ah. Yes, from Dr. Jong, please. Uh, yeah, just, uh, I, I may miss this part. Can you remind me what's the tall again? How long is the time scale? Um, so it is strictly speaking, it's um, the initial frequency over the um, rate of initial frequency decrease. Um, for something like the crab, it's about 1200 years, um, but it, it's dependent on the particular star in question. Okay, thank you. I just missed the this part. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's also um, the model is so the schema of where are we? Uh, the schema of Franklin and Lincoln Epstein doesn't actually directly reference uh, time. They just um, because time is not the important factor to the mathematics. It's frequency. So you can we picked an electromagnetic rate of spin down as a way to connect frequency to time. You could have other models of uh, frequency because I know. I believe the crab, the spinning index isn't actually three. I think it, so the breaking index isn't actually three. I think it's like 2.5. Um, so you could do, you could substitute some, some, some type of spin down model like that if you wanted to. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much um, for the question. Also again, uh, Alex, for the talk. Okay, wonderful. So the next uh, speaker on our schedule is uh, Daniel Krzyzewski. And he will be talking about detecting bursts with networks of interferometers. Hi, good afternoon. Could you see my screen? Uh, yes, and we can hear you perfectly. Uh, so, dear participants, my name is Daniel Krzyzewski, and today I'm going to speak about conceivable Euro-Asia network of gravitational detectors. On this map, we, we can see detectors which are already in operation or planned. Today, Russia is actively discussing the possibility of building a detector near Novosibirsk, a city which is an important scientific center in Siberia. We were interested in the question of how to orient the detector in Novosibirsk. The detector orientation angle gamma is defined at the angle between the southward direction of the detector location and the bisector of the angle formed by its arms measured counterclockwise. We consider the Novosibirsk detector as a part of the Euro-Asian network due to the disposition and established international cooperation with groups from India, Italy, and Japan. The idea is to find the orientation angle of the Novosibirsk detector, which, which will provide the best efficiency of the network. For comparison, we will use two intercontinental global networks, LHVI and LHVK. The calculation of the network efficiency is closely related to the construction of the power pattern of a single detector and the network of detectors. So the strain detected by a single interferometer is defined by antenna pattern functions for the two polarizations, F cross and F plus. Power pattern of a single detector is just the sum of the squares. And using the single detector pattern functions, one can construct network pattern functions and power pattern. This picture, you can see antenna power pattern of proposed Novosibirsk detector and the network power pattern for of Euro-Asian network. To estimate the efficiency of the network, we use numerical criteria, which were proposed by Rafael and his group. The first criterion I defines the ability to reconstruct both polarizations of a gravitational wave. And the bigger is the magnitude of this criterion, the better is the sensitivity to both polarizations. The second criteria defines the ability to localize the source is proportional to the area of the triangle formed by the three detectors in the network, which has the, the largest area of all possible detector combinations. Criterion R defines the ability to reconstruct the source parameters. This parameter requires an analytical form of the considered signal. The analysis is based on likelihood formalism, 
The variance of the parameter is defined by a Kramerall bound, which includes calculation of network Fisher matrix. Network Fisher matrix is just a sum of single detectors Fisher matrices. Criterion R is calculated by averaging of the error over the celestial sphere. Efficiency of the network is defined by integral criterion C, which is kind of metric in this parametric space. The bigger is magnitude of C for the given configuration, the better is efficiency. At the first source, we chose the chirp signal of binary and spinal. Here, the parameter reconstruction criteria was calculated for the chirp mass. We considered a uniform distribution of sources over celestial sphere. Here we see the results. Polarization reconstruction parameter is the most sensitive to the orientational angle. The optimal angle which maximizes criterion C is 13 degrees. The table shows the ratio of the criteria values calculated for Euro-Asian network with the optimal detector angle and reference networks. It can be seen that the Euro-Asian network better copes with the recovery of the gravitational wave polarization as well as, being, as well as being relatively effective in restoring the source parameters. The only criterion by which the network is inferior to other two networks is the localization criterion. This is because all of the Euro-Asian network detectors are located in the same continent. We are also interested in gravitational waves from supernova collapse because they are an important source of information about complicated physical processes which take place during, the, uh, during this event. It's worth noting that in the southern part of Russia, we now have detectors which operate in order to detect supernova neutrino gravitational correlations in our galaxy. They are the optoacoustic gravitational antenna and Baksan underground scintillation telescope. Rotational waves can be produced by many mechanisms on different stages of core collapse. Here you can see rotational amplitude from the bound stage, just as an example. But for our calculations, we need a signal with a known analytical form. That's why we consider gravitational waves radiated due to the rotational bar deformation on the stage of proton, proton neutron star. This radiation can be modeled as a radiation of rotating cylinder. We keep the frequency constant, but its time dependence is also an interesting question. The parameter construction criterion was calculated for epsilon, which characterizes the rate of deformation. Its typical value is of the order of one third. In this case, we can assume uniform distribution of the sources due to weakness of the signal from core collapse. So we integrate the parameters over the Milky Way disk. This requires averaging of time dependent functions over 24 hours. In this case, the optimal angle is 40 degrees. So now the results of Euro-Asian network are a little bit worse than for CHIRP, but still acceptable. To make a conclusion, I would say that now we got two optimal angles and the choice will probably depend on the future tasks of the network. Moreover, the approach to calculating of the efficiency have to be modified to work with more complicated signals from other stages of core collapse. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, questions for Dr. Kuchevsky. So for the pause, I'm just checking to see if there's anyone with their hands up. But while people are thinking, can, can I ask, a, maybe it's not a completely scientific question, but can you um, speculate usefully on um, how likely uh, the Novosibirsk um, facility is to be built? Uh, well, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think that due to due to the pandemic, all the plans are you know 
a little bit spoiled, but probably in, in the next years, uh, this project will be really actively discussed here. And I hope that uh, the detector will be built and Russia will join this global initiative for gravitational wave search. Uh, let me to comment. So Rudenko, I am a co-author of uh, this, this talk also. Is it possible? Uh, absolutely. Please go ahead. Is it possible to hear me? No? Yes, very clearly. Uh, no, no uh, it's only comment. The, the question about the, and uh, uh, many conferences we, we discussed this idea, uh, but uh, uh, that is problem of funding, of course. Uh, uh, from the point of position, that is very attractive, uh, attractive point in the middle of Siberia and in respect of the uh, other four Euro-Asian uh, detector. But uh, the problem is a competition of, uh, there is uh, some uh, uh, project for spending big money that is uh, synchrotron in uh, the big synchrotron in the Novosibirsk. But Bootkiller Institute is the key institute who is in this project and also in synchrotron. Synchrotron is uh, more <laughs> close their uh, heart than this one. So uh, th there is a big struggle, a large uh, struggle which project uh, will be winner. Of course, Synchrotron is more preferable. But nevertheless, we continue. This work is just to support the idea of construction uh, the um, uh, detector interferometry in Novosibirsk. That is uh, one of the <laughs> sense of these articles and our calculation. Thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. <clears throat> awesome. Okay, um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Kruszewski, for the talk. So we're now on to the next speaker in the session, um, which is Nikolai Herman, and uh, he'll be speaking about detecting planetary mass primordial black holes um, with resonant EM gravitational wave detectors. Please go ahead. Uh, Nicola. Okay, um, Nicola was here a moment ago. Ah, he's just coming back online. Uh, Nicola, hi, can you hear us? Dr. Herman, can we hear, can you hear us? Uh, okay. Hello. Excellent. Yeah, hello. Um, you're you're ready to speak. Uh, Dr. Kuchevsky okay. didn't okay. use his full uh, his full you're, period, so. You are above schedule, uh, behind schedule. Okay. Um, okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, you, you can see my screen now? Not right now, I can't. I can hear you clearly, but I can't see your screen. Ah, okay. Here we go, yes. Perfect. Okay, Perfect. so uh, welcome everyone. I will speak now about uh, detecting planetary mass primordial black hole with resonant electromagnetic gravitational wave detectors. So um, gravitational waves usually um, are detected by interferometry and the frequency are from nanohertz to kilohertz, but there are also several interests in uh, high frequency, uh, megahertz to even terahertz. And uh, there are some possible astrophysical sources for these uh, frequency. I recommend uh, this review over high frequency gravitational wave on archive. Um, this could be transient signals or stochastic background. And uh, it could be sources from the early universe, uh, such as pre-eating, inflation, phase transition, and so on 
or late universe like new neutron star mergers or some exotic compact objects. And uh, which is the, the main subject here uh, for the sources is the primordial black hole mergers. So for primordial black hole mergers, primordial black holes are dark matter candidate and could explain at least a part of the dark matter in the universe. And there is an interest in uh, subsolar masses detection because it will point to a, a primordial origin. And we study uh, in, the, in the paper on archive here, um, we study two mechanisms. First is primordial black hole binaries that survive to the expansion of the universe, but it's a binary system isolated. Or the, um, it could happen that there is a tidal capture of primordial black hole in uh, dense halos. And so uh, this could, the, uh, a merger could happen. And I, I want to highlight that there is a link between frequency and mass of the, uh, the merging black holes with uh, this formula. And um, I will make a short review about uh, electromagnetic waves and gravitational wave coupling. So in 1962, uh, Gerzenstein introduced the wave resonant mechanism. And in the 70s, uh, Grishuk et, uh, et al. Uh, used resonant cavities as detectors, it's theoretical work. And more recently, in 2019, uh, there is a, an article by Ejli et al. Uh, that speak about graviton photon conversion with the ALPS experiment. So, what is the wave resonance called the uh, direct Gerzenstein effect? You have an electromagnetic wave that passes into a, a constant magnetic field here. And this uh, effect will produce a gravitational wave. And you can see the dimensional analysis of the amplitude of the uh, gravitational wave. But so we can show that there is a coupling between electromagnetic wave and gravitational wave, but the coupling is very tiny. So for example, the dimensional analysis to generate a strain of order 10 to the minus 21 with a mag magnetic field of 10 teslas and um, for the electromagnetic wave, an electric field of one mega volt per meter, we need, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, we need a length of one, more than 100 light years. So that's very huge. Uh, so it's to, to show the, the tiny coupling in the gravitational wave generation. This mechanism, Gerzenstein effect, um, could be applied for some astrophysical uh, sources that has a, a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field, and it was studied by Zeldovich in the in the seventies. But for uh, the detectors of um, the electromagnetic detectors, we use the inverse Gerzenstein effect. So here we have the gravitational wave. We have the constant transverse magnetic field, and the, the fact that the gravitational wave is passing will, will produce a faint electromagnetic wave. And so we, we try theoretically to apply this to gravitational wave detection. So to modelize that, we use the Maxwell equations in GR. And these Maxwell equations in GR um, can be combined to, um, to get the electromagnetic wave equation. For the, the metric, we use a Minkowski background and the perturbation is the incoming gravitational wave in the Lorentz gauge. And for the electromagnetic field uh, analysis, we split our field in two parts. 
The first part is the static external field, so the constant transverse magnetic field. And the perturbation is the first order induced field. So it's the faint electromagnetic wave produced by the Gerstein effect. And using this, um, these are assumptions, we can get a wave equation for the first order perturbation sourced by the static field and the second derivative of the gravitational wave. Uh, I want to uh, highlight the, uh, the importance uh, that the magnetic field must be transverse uh, to the direction of the gravitational wave. So um, there is a, a theorem by Ivan Choquebrua using a, a plane wave approximation that show that if the magnetic field is longitudinal, then the source term of the wave equation will be will vanish. Uh, in this Gerstein effect, um, the response of the detector will have the same frequency content as the uh, gravitational wave. So it could be suitable for high frequency gravitational wave, for example, here, primordial black hole mergers. And what is interesting uh, in this is that we can scope different bandwidth than LIGO, LISA, and so on. And if we look at the dark matter field, the, there is the action dark matter experiment. And it's a resonant cavity, electromagnetic, but the magnetic field is, um, oh, sorry, the magnetic field is uh, longitudinal and not transverse. So we have to rotate the magnetic field if we want to, to do something with this kind of experiment. So uh, in, the, in the paper on archive that you can uh, find here, uh, the link is above here. Um, we study two cylindrical cavities. First, the hollow one, TM resonator, and the coaxial one, TEM resonator. It's uh, patented uh, detectors, and um, you can see here the magnetic field transverse to uh, the cavity. So um, if we go back to the, um, to the wave equation, we can project them on the proper function of the Laplacian, and, for, uh, and we obtain several equations for each k m n mode of the proper function. We obtain here a, a harmonic oscillator equation. And if we want to compute the energy variation inside the cavity at first order, we can see that only the k 1 o modes are contributing to the energy variation. And this k 1 o mode are sourced by this expression. Here, we retrieve the second derivative of the gravitational wave. So here was the uh, modulation. And now we try to do some numerical simulation. So we use uh, the library light simulation to, to produce our waveforms. So here is for a planetary mass primordial black hole, 10 to the minus five solar masses. And we can see here the waveform and here the frequency content of the waveform. And I made a little simulation in video, so I will launch it. So here is the uh, primordial black holes merging. Here you can see the gravitational wave coming into the cavity. And here you can see the uh, induced power in our cavity. And we can see that when the uh, gravitational wave will reach a, a certain frequency, the, there will be a boost. It's a resonant response to the detector. So we excite a resonant frequency in, a, in our detector and the output will be boost. 
if you are interested in, in this simulation, uh, you have a link to the video uh, in the in the slide uh, in the PDF slide uh, on the website. And there is another simulation for all to reach that use a sound analogy to analyze uh, the input and the output of our detector. So um, here are the response for the TM cavity and TM cavity. And both cavities have a root mean square induced power of the order of 10 to the minus 10 watts. And if we look at the uh, frequency response, we can see that we have the same frequency content between input and output. So, um, but we can see that there are peaks here in the frequency response. And these peaks correspond to the resonant frequency of our cavity. So the frequency response is boosted near the uh, um, resonant frequencies. And we can study the, the response in function of the mass of the black, primordial black hole merger. So here is the mass of the primordial black hole. So we assume equally um, equal mass for the two uh, masses. And we can see that if we tune the parameter of the cavity, here is the maximum radius of the cavity, we can see that we can uh, change a little bit the response of the cavity. Um, so here is the induced uh, power. And we can see that depending on the mass that we want to, uh, to highlight, we can tune the parameter of the cavity. Uh, we can also set um, an arbitrary um, experimental limit, 10 to the minus 10 watts, and see how far we, um, how, um, which fraction of dark matter made of light primordial black hole we can maybe detect with this kind of detector. So in yellow is the, uh, limit for light primordial black hole made by micro lensing uh, observations. And here you have the expected limits with our detector for the tidal capture in clusters for primordial black hole, and here for primordial binaries isolated. And so we can reach a quite low value for the fraction of dark matter made of light PBH for the 10 to the minus 5 uh, mass, uh, solar mass. So here are my conclusions. So um, in, in the paper on archive here, we develop um, complementary gravitational wave detector, complementary with respect to LISA interferometry and uh, LIGO. So um, because it will scope different frequency and so on. And um, we are uh, an example of the analysis that we can make is study the fraction of dark matter made of light PBH, as we've seen before. And also another perspective for, for this type of detector is maybe to highlight the cosmological gravitational wave stochastic background. Uh, it could be uh, interesting and maybe also to, to scope the, um, the cutoff frequency of the, uh, of the stochastic background. And more generally, it could be useful for many fields in fundamental physics. For example, early universe cosmology or exotic compact objects. But I, I want to, to remind you that our goal uh, we made theoretical and numerical uh, results and uh, our goal of our paper and it, it'll, it will be published very soon um, in physical review D. Uh, our goal is to provide some motivations for uh, uh, an hypothetic experimental development of this kind of detector. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Nicola. Very interesting talk. Okay, um, we have two or three minutes for uh, questions. Uh, if possible, uh, I have a small questions, uh, Rudenka. It's, sorry, who, Rudenka? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, uh, Nicola, so first, uh, when you're talking about the um, collision of primordial black holes, which frequency do you mean in, in your mind? I mean the gravitational okay. wave. Um, yes, the, um, for example, for 10 to the minus five solar masses, uh, in frequency we are uh, at the order of uh, 100 megahertz. It's, uh, 100 it's uh, megahertz, 10 to eight. Okay, so uh, the next, uh, next, uh, no, some comment. Do, do you know the experimental detector for the primordial, not primordial, but uh, stochastic uh, background? In a high frequency um, region uh, in uh, Chinese, they developed the, the detector you mentioned, the uh, cruise groups they are connected with in China, yes. in uh, 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 Chongqing universities, or you don't know this work? Uh, I, I know the, 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 the cruise team uh, with the, the. That is Birmingham. Cruise, that is Birmingham. I am talking about the China. So maybe uh, you mean. So I uh, put attention. So there is a, there is already experimental example of such kind of detector. And uh, last, uh, no, that is comments, maybe not question. Um, okay. And last uh, point also comments. Do you know that uh, we, we have a paper about the um, at high frequency Hertz experiment in lab yes. using using the uh, Hertzenstein direct and uh, uh, inverse effect. So, and there is publication on this. It's, uh, uh, do you know this work? Not. Uh, I'm uh, yes. I, I already read this uh, this uh, idea of a gravitational Earth experiment. And I, sorry, I didn't understand your question. That is not question. The uh, question okay. is, do you know this work? So if not, I yes, yes, uh, yes. I, I I've read uh, I've read the article. Okay, yes. so no, no. Thank you very much. So the, the subject you. it's very intriguing. And so if you will continue, that no more uh, people who put attention to this and work in this uh, uh, sphere of activity. So if you will continue, that it's well valuable things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. It's really appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually have a quick, uh, two very quick questions, Nicholas, but um, the first one is, surely there would be many uh, sources of weak electromagnetic um, radiation between megahertz and terahertz. So um, can you comment a little bit on uh, what noise sources are present that might confound yes. any you know, astrophysical signal? Yes, it's also um, uh, a thing that we we uh, we have to develop if we want to uh, to develop experimental uh, the experimental thing. But I think that the noise are maybe the quite the same as uh, the action dark matter experiment because also they have to um, measure. Uh, low induced electromagnetic power. So I, I think that the challenges will be uh, more or less the same, but we have also to pay attention maybe for the uh, stochastic background, for the sto stochastic background itself. But um, yes, we, we have also to, to develop this, uh, this possible noise sources and maybe the, the resonant effect Will not be as good as we we simulate in our in our simulation. Um, is it right to think that at least theoretically, if you put it inside a very good Faraday cage, would would that exclude sort of external electromagnetic influences, but the gravitational waves would still pass through the Faraday cage, and and then you would get something or or is the fact that you're inside a Faraday cage just kills the electromagnetic waves no matter what produces them? 
that's that's a good question i i th i think that with uh, strong powerful uh, magnets uh, that could uh, that are developed for uh, some big experiments and maybe uh, supraconducting cavities and so on i think that we can reduce the the noise uh, to to get this uh, this resonant response in terms of cavity. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, it, I don't think it's oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, No, sorry, I interrupted you, Nicholas. Please go ahead. Sorry, I, I just I just said that uh, it's uh, uh, very hypothetic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. Okay, um, excellent. Thank you again very much for uh, the talk. So um, we now have one more talk, the last talk of the session, which uh, was once upon a time the first talk of the session. And uh, that is Dr. Alessandro Trani. Um, and he will be speaking about spin misalignment of black hole binaries from young star clusters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I really apologize. Uh, at least I'm relieved that I don't have to stay awake until 1 a.m. this night, uh, just to find that the session has already finished. Um, so uh, this, this talk is based on, the, on this paper here on the archive. It's mostly related to um, the astrophysical interpretation of gravitational wave events. Oh, it's very and difficult to hear you. Maybe you can increase the uh, uh, sound. Let me, let me try to, um, scrolling, this is okay. Uh, can you hear better now, maybe? Maybe like this? You see, this is likely better. That is better, thank better. you. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, so. Uh, the, so the main, main, main topic of, of this talk is, um, uh, what, what we can tell about uh, about the origin of gravitational wave events, and particularly from uh, binary black holes, and how can we use the spin information to answer this question? So again, there are many scenarios proposed uh, for the origin of, of gravitational waves, and involve a very different astrophysical environment from global cluster to nuclear star cluster, agent disks, and even primordial prim universe. And our only way so far to disentangle among all these proposed pathways is to uh, study the merger properties from theoretical models and then compare with observables, uh, which at the moment uh, are uh, masses of the black holes, the spins and the orientation, uh, the merger rate, and of course, the, the combination of these, uh, of these uh, uh, parameters. Uh, so far, uh, we, in principle, we would have also eccentricity and the distance and the localization. But so far, uh, their uh, kind of constraint on these are is quite limited. So uh, this talk, I will focus on spin information, which uh, doesn't come uh, as uh, it comes through some, some degenerate parameters uh, that can be extracted from the waveforms. And so we don't know precisely the spin of the black holes or the orientation with respect to the angular momentum of the binary here. Uh, but we have a combination of these, of these parameters. And one of the main um, parameters uh, that describes spin is called so-called chi-effective. It's, it's a mass-weighted average of the spin projection onto the angular uh, orbital momentum, the orbital angular momentum. So you can see here. Roughly speaking, a chi effective of zero means that the binaries are either non spin, the black holes are non spinning, or they might be misaligned so that uh, the spins of one cancels with each other. And so the total angular spinning angular momentum is uh, somehow zero. And, um, or uh, one means that the black holes are aligned with the orbit, and minus one is they're spinning and they're anti aligned with the orbit. And it uh, can be described by this if we think. 
of theta as being the spin obliquity, just like Earth obliquity. Uh, and the second parameter is kind of complementary to the k-effective. Uh, it's called k-p or precession spin parameter. It relates to the component that, that is not not the component is projected onto the angular momentum, but it is orthogonal to it. So, uh, so if uh, if the spin uh, is perfectly is spin vector is perfectly aligned with the angular momentum of the orbit, then there is no spin component in the binary plane, and kp will be zero. Well, it will be close to one if uh, the spin uh, lies in the binary plane, and of course. Uh, this also depends on the mass ratios. Uh, so in astrophysics, uh, how can we make uh, spinning binary black holes? And with this, I mean first generation spinning binary black holes. Um, so one of the main mechanisms that has been proposed so far is through tidal spin up. So just like uh, with the, the, the moon and the and the Earth, there is a spin orbit coupling due to tides in the in the stellar progenitors, and this can happen if the binary, the black hole binary, uh, originally was born as a stellar binary and undergoes a phase of called common envelope in which uh, the two cores of the stars are get together on a very tight orbit, so the tidal forces are very are very strong, so both spins can get uh, and now the, the, the rotation of the cores increases. And finally, when these two cores collapse to black holes, uh, some of this spin must be retained by the, the, the remnant. So in the end, we obtain spin in binary black holes. Uh, this main, the main issues of these, of these uh, mechanisms is that uh, the spin synchronizes with the orbit, just like uh, the, the Earth moon system. Uh, and so the spins are always aligned with the orbit. So we would expect a, a effective k effective parameter of one, or at least positive. And on the other hand, uh, tidal spin up requires a very small separation. And if two black holes are very shortly separated, then it means also they will merge very quickly. And this also means that most likely uh, black holes that are formed through this channel in the early universe will merge in the early universe because they will have uh, extremely short uh, delay time or coalescence time. And so this kind of scenario I talked about is mostly related to, to primordial binaries. So stars that were born in binaries from the beginning. Uh, what happens uh, is that actually these kind of binaries are also are born in stellar clusters, so they're not in perfect isolation, but they can undergo uh, dynamical interactions in a dense environment, such an open cluster or, or, a, or a young massive cluster. And so these, if the binary that has undergo common envelope evolution undergoes a, a third body encounter, uh, a third body encounter with a passing black hole or a passing star, this might change uh, the orientation of the spin. So this is how it looks like a simulation of a three-body encounter that might happen in a stellar cluster. There was an incoming binary coming from the left and a single body from the right. Uh, they start an extremely uh, chaotic uh, dance of gravitational interaction. And as we know, this is three -body, chaotic three-body problem it doesn't have any stable solution. So the system is bound to break up into a sing into again into a binary and to a single star, and it might happen that the final binary that breaks uh, that ends up exit from this interaction is the same as the original one, so the same black holes or the same stars. In this case, we call it it's an original binary. While if there was a, a swapping between the single and one of the binary members of the initial binary. Uh, then we call this as an exchange of binary. And this, of course, is going to be affecting the gravitational wave uh, properties because the, the masses will be different. And one more thing that this, this uh, three body encounter can change about the, the, the properties of the emerging binary is the orientation of the binary plane. So if initially, 
this binary has undergo, underwent common evolution and tidal spin up. The spins are perfectly aligned with the orbit. After the encounter, it might be that the binary plane is tilted with respect to the original orientation. So we have a, a, um, a tilt angle with respect of the orbit and the spins, which remains in, uh, in the same position if we neglect uh, higher order uh, GR effect, uh, which anyway occurs only when the binary is extremely short, extremely short separation. So this can affect again, uh, the, especially the chi effective parameter and the chi p parameter that we can extract from the gravitational wave. So in order to invest investigate this scenario in an astrophysical setting, um, I run several uh, simulations like this, several tubolic simulations, uh, consistent with the environment that we obtain from uh, we obtain in, uh, in stellar clusters, uh, using population synthesis in order to obtain uh, consistent uh, binary population and also uh, the mass spectrum of the third incoming body, consistent with the metallicity of the clusters. And after this, after running several of these uh, kind of simulations, I can uh, uh, make a distribution of tilt angle. So how much the, the angle uh, between the spins and the orbit is after one encounter, one single encounter. And this is what I've been showing here for uh, three different plots uh, to different metallicities, which affect the mass spectrum of both binaries and uh, single objects. And you see here, uh, this is actually the cosine of the, um, of the tilt angle. So it means that at one, the, the binary is still quite aligned, the black holes are still quite aligned because spins with the orbit, while minus one means it's they're completely anti-aligned. And overplotted here is what was um, uh, recovered or reconstructed from the first, the second gravitational wave transient catalog. And you can see also I separated the two population of original binaries, so binaries which remain with the same binary members and exchanged binaries. So binaries that undergo a, a swap with the one of the members swap with the single. And the distribution is quite different depending on which uh, which of this population the binary come from. So anyway, given the, the tilt angle, uh, we can give we can uh, calculate what is the, the what the expected chi effective or chi, chi p para parameter, and but for this we need to assume some have some assumption of what is the spin of the black holes after the tidal interactions, and since this this kind of physics is quite uh, uh, complicated and most often depends on, on some parameterized models. Uh, here in this work, we have just adopted some phenomenological models. So some extreme models in which we assume that the black holes were uh, maximally spinning. So they have a, a, a dimensional spin of one. Uh, another model in which the spins of the black holes is either random, entirely random and uncorrelated. And another model in which uh, the black hole spin is moderately low between let's say 0. Uh, between zero and, and 0 0.5. So given this, we can calculate what this expected a cumulative distribution of, for example, the k effective parameter. And again, compare it with the, with the gravitational wave uh, observations here. Uh, okay, this is just say, comparing with the cumulative distribution at different metallicity. So it's not uh, entirely, uh, entirely uh, uh, meaningful to make the comparison, but I will show how we can improve this later. So you can see basically that most of the distributions, so if you assume either a uniform distribution in, in dimensional spins or a maximum uh, dimensional spin, uh, this doesn't match at all what we obtain from the observations, but only kind of the beta model in which the dimensional spin is low can, can get closer to the observations. Uh, same for the KP distribution, which uh, only these solid lines here as a function, uh, regardless of the metallicities, it's a bit uh, is closer to the observed cumulative 
uh, distribution. This is the uh, 90% uh, confident interval, computational wave transit catalog too. But in anyway, this this kind of plot is just uh, say some compare very rough comparison because we we include separate metallicities, but what we receive on Earth is a combination of of metallicities of, of different binaries of different metallicities and. Uh, this, of course, will depend on the star formation rate as a function of metallicity and when these binaries are, were actually formed in the universe. So in order to, to kind of convert these distributions into uh, uh, an enca a rate, a merger rate uh, that we can compare with the observations, uh, we have to consider what is the star formation history. And uh, we can do this through these uh, equations here which uh, I won't uh, enter into details. And we also need to estimate what is the encounter rate because this model depends on free body encounter happening at the core of star clusters. And so we have to consider what is the uh, encounter rate using, for example, simple cross-section estimates. And eventually, uh, after putting everything together, star formation rate, uh, distribution of spin parameters, encounter rate, we can obtain the local merger rate for this scenario, which is about 6.6 uh, events per year per gigaparsec cube. Uh, this is a uh, you know, conservative estimate and at the moment lies at the, at the low end of the range uh, currently observed. And we can also compare- So we just the... have a couple of minutes, Alison. Perfect, perfect, thank you very much. So, um, uh, we can, rather than obtain just a, 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 an encounter rate, a merger rate, we can also have a differential merger rate that depends on the spin of the, uh, on the, for example, the k-effective parameter and compare it again with the distribution of k-effective um, uh, parameter in, uh, that was observed. And you can see that these, um, the, what we obtain in the distribution, especially for the beta, param beta, uh, beta uh, model, which spin, uh, dimensionless spin of the black holes is uh, slow, then we can obtain something that matches the observation and particularly can show, can reproduce the negative effective, which indicates that to this, the orientation of the spins of the black hole is the opposite with respect to the, to the binary or the momentum. And same for the, for the KP distribution, uh, the beta model is the one that best explains uh, the observation, which predicts at the moment a peak, either a narrow or a broad peak around 0.2 KIP uh, parameter. So, uh, uh, given everything, so I've shown so far that uh, so these kind of binaries uh, that were, were steadily sp spin up due to uh, post after post combustible evolution can undergo three body encounters. Uh, this encounter rate and the merger rate of these kind of binaries is uh, still, uh, it's possible to detect these binaries. And this model can somehow explain the negative effect that we observe that we, from, from the current uh, observations. Provided of course that the natal spin is low than, is lower than uh, 0.2, the dimensional spin. So this kind of model favors a highly efficient uh, angular momentum transport in stellar interior. So the, the black holes exit the common level of phase, which basically the cores should be quite non-spinning. And so in this scenario cannot, uh, again, this favors uh, uh, or high, very high spins, high, very high dimensional spin, spins of black holes uh, because they are not really matched by the current observations. So this is uh, my end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alessandro. Very interesting results. Um, okay, questions, please, for our final speaker. Uh, probably I have uh, small questions, Rudenka again. Uh, yes. So, uh, it seems to me that uh, initially you, uh, your goal was to 
uh, give some hint how to define uh, the spin parameters of the orbit during the uh, collisions or during uh, having the signal from the mm -hmm. uh, uh, collisions of the binary with spin. Uh, but you uh, then you missed it. So it was your uh, repeat once more. What was your main goal in your calculation? And uh, do you give some uh, uh, additional argument for to define from the form of the signal the spin of the component? Yeah. Um, so uh, the main. Uh, sorry, this is video just uh, okay. Um, so, uh, no, I, I don't have any slides in this presentation about uh, how we can relate the waveform to these two parameters. So, uh, basically, Kaffective is, is, is defined in this way because it's approximately constant during this battle. So, it's, it can be extra extracted from, from the gravitational wave. And uh well the, the this kp parameter is relates to the precession uh, because uh the component of a component of this black hole spin in the in the binary will will induce precession and notation of the spin around the angular total angular momentum uh, but that's it uh, i don't have any uh slides that show this uh, so actually the dependency of, of, of chi, chi effective uh, of the, 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 on the waveform. Yeah. Okay. Have you any archive uh, paper or publication for to look at it or not? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, this is, um, so there are, there are several, several pub publication. I think for one of the latest uh, LIGO Virgo paper. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so, because this is these parameters are really just defined based on observations, so they're kind of convenient to use, but they're not. Uh, yeah, they're just defined like this because they're convenient to to extract from the waveform. Yes. Okay, I look your your uh, family name. That's uh, your paper. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, and I think. I don't see any other <coughs> questions. So let me um, thank all the speakers um, very much for sticking to time, especially um, this electronic format for the excellent um, talks. And um, a big warm thank you to the audience for coming along and making a successful session, not just for this GW1, but also for the last four days. Um, and finally, a thank you to the co-hosts, Alex Karen and Pat Myers, who uh, held the fort um, while my um, connection was, was intermittent. So thank you very much, guys. Um, that brings us to the end of the, the session. Um, well done, everybody. I hope you've had a wonderful Marcel Grossman. It was nice to see people's faces online, even if it was not in person. And um, yes, we'll meet again soon. All the best. Bye. Bye.